بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you very much all for attending this uh, mini conference, uh, which we want to hold in honour of Sheikh Mustafa al adami who passed away recently in December, rahimahullah. And um, of course, the event the event is mixed with a an element of sadness as well as um, happiness. The, the sadness being that this was something that we wanted to do in his lifetime. So a few years ago, um, the Islamic Courses team in London. We had arranged to do this with him, bringing him over, having a celebration of his life and works. But sadly, his health wasn't up to it at the time, and there were some other logistics that we weren't able, able to work through. And it was a shame because I wanted to, in his lifetime, we wanted to be able to celebrate his life to his face because you know, he, he'd been a pioneer. Certainly for myself, um, he was probably the second contemporary um, scholar who was like a hero to me after Sayyid Abdul Hassan Ali Nadwi. And um, it would have been good to tell him um, and celebrate. But you know, even when I got to work with him at the end of his life, uh, it was important that we always used to tell him how much we loved him, we appreciated him, and, um, and how we wanted to celebrate his, his achievements. So the sadness is obviously that we're dealing with the aftermath of, of his passing away. But the positivity is that his is a life that's worth celebrating. In, in so many ways, and that's what we want to try and touch upon uh, today. And secondly, you see, you know, you see the, the, the wonderful speakers that we've got lined up here, and to spend time in their company and to listen to them is a sign of, of his stature, you know, in contemporary, in a, in a certain genre of popular culture. Um, they have a saying that real recognize real. And so having people like, this here, you know, like uh, Ustad Suhaib and Ustad Imtiaz and Sheikh Akram, recognizing Sheikh um, Azmi's um, achievements is itself a sign of, of, of his standing. And it's almost like a continuation of his sort of barakah, his blessing, that you know, we can have this sort of um, event. So what I'd like to start off with is because you can't, you can't have someone like Ustad Sahib Saeed here and not have Tilawa and have a recitation of the Quran and Azhari, Qari. So um, I'd like him to please set things off with some recitation and then we can start, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را تلك آيات الكتاب وقرآن مبين ربما يود الذين كفروا لو كانوا مسلمين ذرهم يأكلوا ويتمتعوا ويلههم الأمل فسوف يعلمون وما أهلكنا من إلا ولها كتاب معلوم ما تسبق من أمة أجلها وما يستأخرون وقالوا يا أيها الذي نزل علي إنك لمجنون لو ما تأتينا بالملائكة إن كنت من 
الصادقين ما ننزل الملائكة إلا بالحق وما كانوا إذا صدق الله العظيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Um, my sort of job is just to first begin things with an overview of his quit of his life. It sets the the scene for the other speakers to speak on certain aspects of his life, and then also to touch upon his standing within Western academia. And so I'll, I'll try and um, just touch on some essential uh, details regarding him. In that regard. So his biography, his essential biography. I don't know if the, if the ladies want to maybe come forward somewhat, if they, if they feel comfortable, uh, if they can't see the slides. Um, so his essential biography, he, he wasn't sure when he was born, but he has estimated <coughs> between 1928 and 1930 in um, Arlington Magad in India the place which produced many great ulama, very close to Jaunpur, where Sheikh Akram is from. Um, and there, mu there must be something in the water of Avamgar, Sheikh Akram, you know, a, a place that produces Shibli Nomani, Hamid al-Din Farahi. Um, there must be something in, in that water that we, we maybe need to benefit from. Um, he then graduated from Dar al-Ulum, Diabund, in 1952. He then, he then received a master's equivalent from al Azhar in 1955 completed his PhD in Cambridge University in 1966, and that was later published as Studies in Early Hadith Literature. Thereafter, he was the director of the National Library in Qatar, um, then becoming an associate professor in 1968 at Umar uh, al-Qura University in Makkah. And from 1973 to 1991, he was the professor of Hadith Studies at King Saud University in Riyadh. In 1980, he was awarded the King Faisal International Award for his contribution to Hadith studies, and um, he then passed away, rahimahullah, in uh, December uh, 2017. His main English works um, are the studies in early Hadith literature, which was published first in 1968, then on Shakt's origins of Muhammadan jurisprudence in 1985, and then the history of the Quranic text from revelation to compilation with the first edition coming out in 2003. His main Arabic works, um, in terms of original works, his first work that he wrote after his thesis was the Qutab al-Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is where he, he, he wrote about the scribes of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it's recently been published as a translation with Torah as the scribes of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in, in this work, he, he proved a large number of scribes, so he upped the numbers um, to close to, I think, 70 was what he, he estimated the scribes of the Prophet were, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then uh, his other significant work was the Manhaj al-Naqad, Ind al-Muhaddithin, where he talks about how the early Muhaddithin um, would use very uh, profound rules in establishing whether a narrator was daif, weak, or, or thicker, or reliable, and showing that it wasn't some arbitrary method that they used, but there was a consistent um, approach that they uh, adopted. Um, then he has some very significant editions of Arabic classics. So one is his Muwatta of Imam Malik in seven volumes, with a very extensive introduction, where he, 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 he lists the large number of narrators of the work and he adds them up to about 110 whereas previously it was about estimated to be about 70 narrators of the work um, he also replies to uh, Bashar Awad uh, Ma'ruf in defending Sheikh uh, defending Imam Malik's approach in narrating the wordings of Hadith whereas Ma'ruf uh, had some other points about Malik maybe changing wordings um, and then also he responded to the authenticity of the text um, in response to maybe people like Norman Calder and others who doubted the authenticity of the work, although Calder's been 
um, refuted by other people in that regard. Then there's the, um, his edition of the Sahih ibn Khuzayma. And this was a work that was considered to be lost to the Muslim world until the Sheikh found a manuscript, re-edited it, and then published it. And um, he then has the Maghazi Urwa ibn al-Zubayr and the Kitab al-Tamiz of uh, Imam Muslim. In terms of his uh, upbringing um, in India, um, his father was a cleric who had, taught, you know, who was, who had somewhat financially <coughs> straitened times. And um, his mother passed away whilst he was very young, so he has no recollection of his mother. And he then had later a strained relationship um, with his um, stepmother. This led to him running away from home a couple of times. The first time he ran away um, was to go to an English-speaking school. His father hadn't wanted him to go to an English-speaking school, so he ran away. Um, his father then came and got him about six months later. Then later his father suggested <coughs> his studies in a religious seminary which he agreed to, but he then ran away um, to study in, in, in Dara Ulum, Diabund. However, before leaving, he had already studied Persian and Arabic with his father, so he was very proficient in, in Arabic by that stage. So um, he'd, he mentions he'd already studied Hidayah uh, Awale, the first two volumes of Hidayah, as well as the Sharah al Wiqaya um, of Mahabubi with his father. So when he goes to Dara Ulum, Diabund, he's already hitting the ground running. He's not going there to initiate um, his studies. And so his studies at Darul Um Diabund, and um, you know, I hesitate to this first part with Hazrat in attendance and Sheikh Akram in attendance, but his, his view was that um, Darul Um Diabund was the best Islamic seminary in the in Indian subcontinent for Hanafi fiqh and hadith, although he said Nadwa was the best for Arabic studies. <laughs> um, and so first he studied fiqh, uh, mantiq, uh, logic, essentially Aristotelian logic through the, um, the Arabs. Uh, falsafa, um, philosophy and tafsir, and then the last two years of his studies in the madrasa were on um, hadith, focusing on ten books. His most famous teacher at the time was uh, Sheikh Hussein Ahmad Madani, who was the uh, Sheikh al-Hadith in Deoband at the time, who um, he mentions as being very easygoing, um, very easygoing, very popular, um, and one thing that the Sheikh does mention about his studies there is he said that although we could read these books fluently, we, he says we couldn't speak two sentences, as speaking wasn't emphasised. And so um, that's one of the reasons why he went to al because he wanted to develop his written Arabic. So he said initially when he went to Diabund, that was the only madrasa he really knew of, and that was what he wanted, um, wanted to achieve his studies. And then he realised that they were bigger and other more famous um, centers of learning outside of Deoband, and he wanted to go to Al-Azhar. So one of the people he sought advice from was uh, Sayyid Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi, who he wrote to. But he said he didn't get a reply back, so he then made a journey from Deoband to Lucknow, to uh, Dar al -Lum. And so he entered this room, and he said about two or three people there. And he just started speaking to them, saying, you know, I'm from what, my, what his name was, why he'd come. And then he didn't realize that the person he was speaking to was Sayyid Abu Hassan because of his humility and his normalness. You know, he, wasn't, he, he was expected to find this big personality, big sheikh, big entourage, and he found this man of great simplicity, someone who he said was perhaps the greatest Zahid that he'd ever met. And he, he mentioned one Ramadan, that the, the food that was brought to Sayyid Abu Hassan was so coarse, he said that even poor people um, wouldn't uh, have it. And um, Ali Mir, Sayyid Abu Hassan, said to him that, um, he said, I did reply to you. You must have not got a reply. He said, stay in Nadwa for a while. But the sheikh said, no, no, I'm, I'm going to go to uh, al -Azhar. Because he said that one thing he got from his father, from the many things, but one thing he got from his father was not knowing how to compromise. He said, my father didn't know the meaning of compromise. And so I went to, uh, I went, uh, to al -Azhar. And many years later, he said, Sayyid Abu Hassan visited him in Qatar. And he said, you didn't listen to my advice and you did the right thing. And um, so the one thing he found when he went to al was that it was a modern system um, which contrasted with the Dirban system. So for him, the Dirban system was one where you would read all the books, whereas the modern system was one where you would partially read the books and then be examined on them. And he, he didn't feel that was an advantage. He felt the traditional system was more advantageous and that you read more of the work. And he said uh, one of the things about the modern system is that you can sometimes have a person who's got a PhD in Hadith but yet they've never read Sahih al-Bukhari. 
simply because their PhD might have been on an area that was separate to that. And he felt that that was a problem, that you, you can't be considered an expert of hadith without having studied um, something like Sahih al-Bukhari. Then he went to Cambridge, um, and he said his purpose for going to Cambridge was to get uh, a PhD to defend the Sunnah, not to get a PhD for, the sake, for its own sake, for as a career progression. And because at the time, in Pakistan, in Egypt, there were these debates about the authenticity and the legal validity of the Sunnah. And so he referred to people like Sayyid Maududi um, defending the Sunnah uh, in the subcontinent. And then people like uh, Mahmoud Abu Raya who were attacking uh, and making certain comments about the Sunnah. So he wanted to do um, a study in a Western university where no one could then say, well, you haven't done this according to the exacting standards of scholarship. So he wanted to defend the Sunnah by doing it that way. And he mentioned how he had no problems at all in Cambridge. He had an excellent relationship with his teachers. His first supervisor was A.J. Arbery. Um, but then Sargent, who was there at the time, said to, uh, said to Arbery that, give me Azami. So he gave him Azami. And the sheikh wasn't, wasn't aware of why Sargent did that. Um, but one thing for sure, he wasn't influenced by Sargent. He said, the one thing they said about me there is they said, Azami is very good, but he has a head like hajr, like stone. So you can't, you can't change him and, and swing him your way. So regarding his studies in early hadith literature, because what I'll do, I'll just maybe focus on these two books, I have other people who can speak in other parts. Um, he responded to the claim that hadith was very late and that you couldn't accept or defend it because of the weakness of human memory. So he set out to prove that hadith were written in the prophetic times using sources from the 8th and 9th century, which mention written sources, which he defended. And he mentioned there's a misunderstanding that Hadith were only transmitted orally into the mid to late second century. And he says that even traditionalists like Dhahabi and Ibn Hajar um, would repeat this, despite their own work showing that there, were, that there, there was a written culture <coughs> in existence. And he said the reason for misunderstanding this is not taking into account, one, the data itself, but then misunderstanding things like the meaning of Tadween, collection and Tasneef classification, as writing down. Um, and so he, he set out to prove that that was a, a misunderstanding, as well as also proving that terms like hadathana, akhbarana, you know, it was narrated to us, wasn't merely a reference to purely oral transmission, but it also referred to, in certain instances, written sources being used as well, whether the sheikh reading to the people or the people reading to the sheikh. But the reason why they only used this sort of term was to emphasize the personal contact because merely narrating from books is considered weak in, in a hadith narration. He also defended the Isnad system and that it was in operation from the time of the Prophet It was used by the companions to narrate hadith and that continued down uh, through the ages. And he did say to claim that hundreds of thousands of scholars spent their lives making forgeries in coll collusion and produced this vast literature with all biographical details is to show an utter disregard for human nature. Um, Arbery um, wrote a foreword to his PhD when it was published, saying, in this field of hadith, Dr. Azmi has done pioneer work of the highest value, and he has done it according to the exact standards of scholarship. The thesis which he presented is, in my opinion, one of the most exciting original investigations in this field of modern times. Then he responded later to uh, Schacht's Origins of Mohammedan Jurisprudence, uh, his first task was to uh, prove that the Prophet وسلم, had created a legal system and that law was not, sat, was not outside of the religion and he was a religious, political and legal authority. He then also said that the ancient schools from Iraq, from Medina, from Syria were never uh, resistant to the prophetic sunnah but based their decisions on it as best they could and that there was no living tradition before the traditions of the Prophet and that Sharp had this um, habit of making arbitrary use of very limited sources and then making generalizations. So say taking examples from the Mu'at of, of, of Malik or the Risal or Shafi'i and then imposing those conclusions on the whole of Islamic, of the Hadith literature. And also where he misrepresents certain early polemics um, between uh, early um, people. And then finally, the misuse of the e silencio argument, where if a jurist writes a book and doesn't quote a hadith in one instance, but then later on in another scholar does quote that hadith, 
Sharp to make this idea, would have put forward this argument that it was it was invented in the meantime. Whereas Sheikh said that, uh, as many other scholars have done, that this is a misunderstanding of the nature of legal works, because the purpose of legal works is to teach law, not hadith. You go to hadith books for those to be taught. So, um, one of the evidences that he used for that was to look at, say, later scholars who who would narrate less than what they had taken from their teachers. So, for instance, Shaybani is Muatta is smaller than the motto of Malik, which he took it from, as he abridged it. And likewise, the Athar works of uh, the two students of Abu Hanifa, Abu Hanifa both Abu Yusuf and um, Shaybani. Now, sadly, Sheikh Hazmi did mention that um, the result of his work was to be generally ignored in Western academic circles, and it would only be put under the Islamic perspective, as John Burson did in his introduction to Hadith. And he said, for a long time, I thought these people were objective scholars, although making a lot of mistakes, and uh, they had no bad intention. But after many years, I know they now have a political agenda. And so one might ask, is this paranoia? And it was interesting in 2012, when, um, um, the, when we at the Islamic Courses hosted Jonathan Brown and Sheikh Akram, is that um, Jonathan Brown um, mentioned that, he said, I'm, I'm going to reveal my biases today. And he said, and also maybe the latent racism uh, in the West, he said, when I was working on my Hadith book in 2008, because the first edition comes in 2009, so he'd already published his, his PhD on the canonization of Bukhari and Muslim. He said he'd seen this work by Sheikh Azami, but he'd never read it. He just thought it was some Muslim scholar saying, and as he quotes, stupid stuff that isn't going to convince anybody, and is a pietistic attempt to rebut a Western scholar, so I was not going to waste my time. He said, but when writing the book on Hadith, he thought, well, you know what, I probably have to be thorough and at least refer to it in a line or two. So he read it and he then, he then realised it was an excellent book with really good arguments and when he was extremely impressed and then concluded it was a good book. And he rebuked himself, he said, for his own prejudices and assumptions. So this is very honest of Jonathan. You have to remember, Jonathan at this stage is, he's a Muslim. So he's not an Islamophobe. He's not anti-Islam or Muslims. But even he has th that perspective after doing a PhD at the University of Chicago and has an attitude. So imagine people who have a totally different attitude in this regard. Um, however, you, there, there, there is um, praise of uh, Sheikh um, Azmi. Uh, Fazal Rahman called an effective response to Shart, and he said that Azmi was the leading Hadith scholar in his experience. Uh, likewise, Mustan Samir. And then also Mustan Samir um, <coughs> quoted Sheikh Azmi's great command of textual sources and his ability to use primary and secondary works to draw um, arguments from. So <coughs> going forward, I think we want to see what is the legacy of Sheikh Azmi in Western academia. I think it's one brilliance with original sources, in particular manuscripts, which is what he worked on. And as when we, we at Islamic Courses hosted uh, Wayan Halak in London, he mentioned that only 1% of manuscripts in the Muslim world have been published, 1%. So you can imagine how, me, how much is still to be uncovered uh, by scholars. Then secondly, having a disavowal of hasty conclusions, not rushing to conclusions on the basis of a few sources. And then having, naturally, a greater respect for the Muslim tradition as more original sources come to light. And so the way forward is to maybe understand some of the prejudices that exist in Islamic <coughs> studies uh, in the West academia. I think, you know, things are perhaps better, but they could, be, they could be even better. Maybe one advice is about being cautious and being too polemical. Sheikh Azmi's work was often rejected because of its polemical nature. And so maybe to um, uh, use a more politically correct way um, in, in rebutting things. But to understand that his work is, not a, is, is a platform, not a manifesto, is that his work is there to be developed upon, not to just be um, the final word on these topics. And that we do need to reinvigorate Islamic studies, but like Sheikh Azmi, we should require mastery, not just mere familiarity of topics. And we also need to require uh, sincerity from our intellectuals and our scholars. And so with that, inshallah, we'll break for <coughs> Asa, and then we'll come back, inshallah, um, and hear the... Uh, the learned uh, sheikhs uh, speak in Shalom. We'll pray downstairs. Prayers downstairs, Shalom. <coughs> Let's start with the next um, next presenter, um, our, our teacher, uh, 
Saeed, Saeed from uh, Scotland, and um, his background initially was in philosophy from at Edinburgh University. He then went and got a degree in Suruddin from uh, Al Azhar. Returned back here recently, uh, received his PhD um, at SOAS, University of London, in Quranic studies. A tafsir, uh, tafsir of Quran, bil Quran. Okay, so the, the, the commentary of the Quran with the Quran itself. And uh, he also runs the Quranica.com website. He's also, also head of research at the Bayan Institute um, in America, Texas, I believe. Um, so he's a, he's a very international, <laughs> international scholar uh, in many respects. So, uh, and he, his presentation will be on um, Sheikh Hazmi and his contribution to Quranic studies. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala al-Mubhuthi rahmatan al-Alameen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum uh, brothers and sisters. Let me say from the outset um, that I'm uh, actually very honoured to be asked to participate in this panel, especially with those who, who knew the Shaykh uh, personally and worked with him, and those who are better placed to to understand and to, to be the real that recognizes real and who are able to explain to you the contribution of the Sheikh. I am in no position to evaluate um, the contribution of Sheikh Muhammad Mustafa Alvami to Quranic studies, uh, nor did I have the honor of meeting him. I did send my salam to him through Sheikh Imtiaz. I, hope, I believe that he did pass the honor and send salams back. Um, and that was merely because, as a youngster, having been inspired by his works, I had this um, sense or a need for a connection, even a spiritual connection with somebody who has an influence on you and who you recognize as being um, a leader in some way, and someone whose example that you, you hope to be able to follow. Um, I would prefer to have titled this talk the perspective of a young whippersnapper. I don't know if that's a term you use in the north of England. But when I think about my experience with the works of Sheikh Muhammad Mustafa Alami, it does take me back to my teenage years because my first experience of him was through this book. And many of you have seen it, know it, have read it. And this particular copy of the book is the copy I bought as a teenager at a Dawa course, which was being delivered by Brother Dawood Matthews, you may know him. And he recommended this book to us and said that it's an important work for us to know if we are involved in the field of explaining Islam or answering questions about Islam or convincing people of the truth and beauty of Islam. And when I saw it, I was like, Okay, history of the Qur'an, check. Comparative study with Old and New Testaments, check. This charming graphic on the front, which contains a few different manuscript copies of the ayah from Surah Al-Hijr, which we, we heard at the beginning. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ That indeed we have sent down the dhikr or the message, and we indeed will preserve it. And incidentally, because this is looking at the different manuscripts, there is good news of another of the Sheikh's books that is coming out. Um, as Sir Andrew mentioned to you about Turath Publishing, they have another book which looks at uh, Surat al-Isra through about 17 or 19 different manuscripts. It's a beautiful uh, representation. I'm not here representing any publisher or any organization. But this is one of the Sheikh's works which is deserving of our uh, appreciation. It is called Ageless Quran, Timeless Text. But also uh, from the Sheikh's profile, Dilband plus Azhar plus Cambridge, big check. Because I thought that was amazing. And just encountering this book, even 
beyond getting past the cover and the bio, I was already filled with a whole bunch of emotions. And this book, as I went on to read it, made me feel inspired, made me feel empowered, made me feel confident, but also humbled. Humbled at the extent of knowledge that a man like this is able to show us and reveal to us how far we have to go. And humbled also to realize that the many great scholars or Western academics and Orientalists that he was responding to, despite their stature and their status, and despite their contributions, they too can fall into error. And people, no matter how uh, glittering their profiles may be, can put out work which is mistaken or is even shoddy. And if that applies to certain groups of scholars, it doesn't mean that other groups are immune from it. So it's a point that should make us humble, no matter which part of the, the world or which background and perspective we are coming from. So this was at the time, you know, these uh, universities caught my attention, including Al-Azhar, which is, of course, uh, so famous. Fast forward to a time when I was studying in the, the faculty of Usul al-Din, and we were studying a topic called Al-Istishraq wa Tabshir, Orientalism and uh, Christian Mission. And I wish we had a book like this as our textbook. Because in reality, a lot of the studies there are found to be stuck in a certain period of time. And Orientalism in this course didn't get past you know, the early parts of the 20th century. And we were still learning about what happened at the Cairo conference and then the Edinburgh conference, 1906, if I remember. Hopefully I got this right on the exam. But we were learning about things that, that go back a bit. And the Sheikh in this book does tackle many of these same figures uh, thoroughly um, and, and very significantly. But of course, there always remains the need to update and to tackle later manifestations of the same or related uh, studies of Islam. And Ustad Andrew, of course, has been working over the last uh, while with the Sheikh in order to produce a new edition of this book. And we hope, inshallah, that this work will still come to its fruits and it will still benefit. <coughs> and this shows us something about Sheikh Aldami as well, that he recognized that need to update and also to address new questions. Questions which are coming from non-Muslims, questions also that come from ourselves as, as Muslims who are in the academy and who are, who are looking at things based on, um, on the, the approaches that we have chosen for our study. Now, the Sheikh also contributed um, to a number of projects that were out and about, and here I'm not looking for my uh, WhatsApp, I'm looking for a quote from the Sheikh which he gave an endorsement to an effort which is coming from, from Canada called the Integrated Encyclopedia of the Qur'an. And I want to read to you some of what he said here because it represents the frustration of a scholar who has mastered his field, but who has perhaps tried to be part of that conversation that's happening in the West. And he speaks here, about how he has uh, had to deal with writings of various Orientalists. <coughs> and he says that a lot of the work is, quote, disguised under an umbrella of impartial academia. And he talks about the Encyclopedia of the Qur'an, which was produced by, by Brill in the Netherlands. He says, in examining these works, in poring over the featured articles, I feel a revulsion so heavy that I wholeheartedly believe it is in the best interest of every sincere Muslim scholar to refuse any invitation to participate in these ventures. I myself, in fact, he says, was asked by Brill to contribute an article for the encyclopedia many years ago. The topic they offered me, bodily fluids. And who, I wondered at the time, would have the honor of penning the key articles on revelation, prophethood, the nature of the Quran, and early Islamic history. So we see in this quote, or in this um, short essay, that he is advocating a certain rejection or 
um, or, or, or shunning really of participating in projects where Muslim voices and Muslim scholarship would be used in a way to lend some sense of legitimacy or some uh, image of diversity while being within um, a, a framework which is not going to respect the things that Muslims hold dear. Fast forward to the recent publication called The Study Quran, which came out from, from Harper One or from Harper Collins. In fact, you can see that the Sheikh had one essay within that volume, and he was asked to contribute on, um, I don't remember the specific title, but it was on the nature of the Quran and the Muslim approach to the Quran. So this essay, of course, it goes without saying, doesn't mean that the Sheikh um, had a chance to see the contents of the volume or that he endorsed the contents of the volume. But he contributed this essay, which represents his point of view. And even both those efforts, the IEQ, the Integrated Encyclopedia of the Quran, and even the study Quran, despite reservations that we can legitimately uh, raise concerning it, and concerning the stances that it's taken towards certain questions, such as plurality of religious truths and so on. Putting all that aside, both these projects come from a point of view of trying to make the Muslim reception and Muslim attitude to the Quran front and center of the way that Quranic studies scholarship is given to the world. And you can see, if you like, an essay done by one of the <coughs> editors of the study Quran, Joseph Lombard, where he speaks about it in terms of colonialism. So his essay is called Decolonializing Quranic Studies. And he originally delivered this at SOAS in 2016. And I think that he found that his first draft was maybe too strident and is working on a, another version of that to be published. I mention this because colonialism, as you uh, are I'm sure aware, one of the end results of it is immigration. That when uh, countries like Britain have colonized other countries, then eventually many of us, myself included, are here as an end result or a fruit of these efforts. And likewise, if uh, Orientalist scholarship can be seen as some kind of colonization, then likewise there is increasing immigration of Muslims into the Western Academy. And I'm wondering for myself, how is that going to change things? Just as there are people uh, in this society who are worried about how immigration is going to change our basic culture, well, likewise, there are people who are welcoming and others who are less welcoming to the presence of committed Muslims inside Western Academy. And it is yet to be seen what kind of results and what kind of changes will come from this. At the same time, I believe we need to carve out something which you could call, if you want, a Western Islamic academic space. Because there are things which are beneficial about Western academic culture, at least. And yet, there are those who are committed to certain principles and certain starting points in their academic exploration. In this, we can take inspiration from Sheikh Adami's initiative seeing a gap and seeing a question that is raised and rising to the challenge of answering it. An example of that is the book that Andrew has mentioned, The Scribes of the Prophet. If a question is raised, who, how many scribes? So he goes and he gathers them. In this edition, there are 65 people mentioned, um, and he discusses various details about these different names. And like that, our own Sheikh Akram's effort around female hadith scholars and muhaddithat is an example in this regard of seeing the gap and filling it in the best possible way which demonstrates a wide access to the Islamic sources. One of the scholars uh, who's, who's Mauritanian and he's based in Qatar, Sheikh Muhammad Mukhtar Shinkli, <coughs> he speaks about how few books there are that are unique contributions that actually move things forward. <coughs> And with that, he discusses a range of scholars who he calls Khairat al-Uqul al-Muslima, like the elite intellects of the Muslims. And the things that he identifies in these names, and he talks about people like Ismail Raja al-Faruqi, he talks about people like Muhammad Abdullah Daraz, 
And the thing that gathers them together, and with them, Sheikh Muhammad Mustafa Al-Dhami, I don't know if he, he counted him in his, uh, in his lectures, but it is the combination between East and West. It is gathering the knowledge of, roughly speaking, the East, and also engagement and presence in the West. And that is obvious, and doesn't need to be explained, in the life of Sheikh al himself. But the questions that this raises for me is, how do we who are in the West and coming from the West, despite the immigration story I told you, those of us who are born here and grow up within this culture, what do we in the West have to offer, and even to offer to our brothers and our sisters in the East? How do we ground ourselves in tradition and make the use of the best new analytical methods and tools? Can those tools be used in creative ways that affirm our thawabit, our, our fixed reference points and established norms as Muslims? and perhaps even subvert their use against our thawabit. Just as in the past, scholars of Kalam rose to the challenge raised by the philosophers by using those tools and turning them to the favor of the established Islamic doctrines. These are questions that I am left pondering. Sheikh Adami's legacy, I feel a certain pull and a push from it. The push to follow in his footsteps at the same time, that pull and that, <coughs> that negative experience that he had that has left him with a negative impression of the possibility of being part of this conversation in Western Academy. And I think, and I was left with no conclusion until Ustad Andrew has left us with two key words, <coughs> mastery and sincerity. These, I think, are the keys for us. How do we gain mastery and how do we maintain sincerity? And... I have to say that I'm not sure which of these is the harder challenge to gain mastery or of the Islamic sciences or to reach a stage of sincerity. But in any case, we ask for Allah's tawfiq and inshallah we look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Which is like Makhir. <coughs> Um, the, the book, uh, there is a new book that has just come out that uh, was referred to um, by Sheikh Arni, the one on the various um, manuscripts. I can find it. Yeah, here we go. Hopefully it's will come up the screen or no. <coughs> Oh yeah, that's better, better than on my screen. Um, the Ages Quran, timeless text. So, Torah, we're very happy that we're all plugging in their new book, as well as the Qutab and Nabi, so we get some brownie points with Yahya. Um, but yeah, this, is, this has just been released. Sadly, we couldn't bring some copies up, um, but it's going to be out very soon. And um, if I can invite our next speaker, uh, our Ustad, our teacher, uh, Intiaz Daniel, who studied in, originally in Blackburn, where he's from <coughs> the seminary there, before obtaining a BA at um, the University of Leeds in Arabic and Islamic studies. He then um, sought further religious studies in Riyadh, which <coughs> then had his 15-year relationship with uh, Sheikh Azmi. And I apologize to the P Arabist Puritans, me butchering his name by saying Azmi. But, you know, 20 years ago, we were talking about aims and bars, and so we just, you know, I, I plead, not the fifth, I plead the Urdu on this. So, um, so I, I apologize for the RSB pronunciation, but it's a habit. Um, without getting all of them, you know. And so, um, and, and then Yemti has returned to be the CEO and founder of the Abu Hanifa Foundation in Blackburn, uh, which has so many interesting things to know about, so you should research that. He's currently... Um, pursuing postgraduate research on Islamic education at the University of Warwick. Um, and without any further ado, I'll oh, introduce just... you. <coughs> Bismillah. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم uh, Obviously I'm at a difficult situation I know we have uh, Sheikh Akram just after me and I'm sure you're all waiting to listen to him as much as I am so uh, I'll, I, and the, I, I know for sure at the same time that 95% of the content I've prepared for today I won't be able to cover um, because how can you cover uh, 15 years of uh, time spent with someone uh, like uh, Sheikh al Adami, uh, Rahimahullah. Uh, just to say right from the beginning, this is not a, a kind of an academic or a scholarly discussion because of the nature of the event and also the, the kind of time that's been allocated. What I will try and do is just talk about some of the aspects of the Sheikh's life. It might appear somewhat random. Uh, my plan was to initially just talk about, because um, I was told to talk about my personal interaction with the Sheikh, the idea was to just mention some elements which I feel are important or things that I realised through my interaction with the Sheikh. But then I also wanted to briefly touch upon some of the Arabic writings of the Sheikh. And I think um, there's a, 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 I feel there's a big problem that um, even when it comes to Muslim, especially new students who are starting to write in the field of hadith, I uh, a while back also read a PhD that was written in hadith studies, and uh, Sheikh Al Adami was unfortunately described as someone who who's you know lost in translation, basically trying to indicate that he didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't really under understand shafts. And that's why um, his response was weak. Um, and I feel that kind of tone repeated by several, even Muslim writers. And then when I look at their bibliography, they've only looked at two of the Sheikh's works. And both of them are in English. Didn't even realize that the, early st the studies in early Hadith literature that he did at Cambridge was a shorter version. And that his Arabic version is a slightly more detailed one because of circumstances where he ran out of funds and so on, that he had to then do a more detailed one in Arabic. And then his Nata in the Muhaddithin, uh, that has elements which is then found in the English language. So to do justice to the Sheikh, <coughs> you know they say in literature review, right? The basic thing that you do as part of a methodology is to read up on all of the writings of the Sheikh before you make a judgment about what he has contributed in this area. So I won't be able to do all of that today, but hopefully if I have time, I'll try and touch upon certain elements. But at the same time, I also want to talk, because again, you've got the writings of the Sheikh in the 60s and 70s, and then he disappears, right? And then suddenly comes out in 2000 with the history of the Quran text. So then you think, okay, where has he been all this time, and what has he been doing, right? And I think that's quite important to demonstrate what he was doing, because I think what he was doing, even though... Uh, looking at it now, maybe it didn't see the fruits that he wanted, but I think it was an important exercise that we as kind of new students coming into this area need to appreciate. So let's first talk about my first interaction with the Sheikh. Uh, I was uh, obviously doing my studies at Leeds University in Islamic Studies. Uh, this was between 96 to 2000. And that's when I was, um, I started to read the writings of the Sheikh in English. Um, I was doing uh, Chubb Security at the time, uh, which is a great job because you do a security of an empty property uh, during the night time for 12 hours, right? And so you just take your books with you and you just read the books. So that was my first interaction. Now at that time, even before Leeds, I had applied for Azhar and I'd also applied for Medina. Uh, I'm still waiting for their response until now I didn't get a response from them. But then when I read the Sheikh's writings, uh, uh, fascination that you know, I need to now go to meet the Sheikh and I need to go to Riyadh and be, uh, go and study at uh, King Saud University. So <coughs> after, 2001, I'm in Riyadh, um, and um, I'm already familiar with some of the students of the Sheikh who are already teaching at the department, and I insisted that I wanted to meet the Sheikh as soon as possible because in reality that's the reason I'm here, not to kind of study from you guys, but to study from the Sheikh. And so uh, my first meeting was arranged with the Sheikh, with one of his senior students. And I went to the Sheikh's house, and I have to say, it was one of the most disappointing visits that I can ever think of. 
uh, uh, maybe in my kind of youth, uh, the kind of dress code was inappropriate and my kind of question was inappropriate, but literally I left that meeting saying to the person who had bought me that I'm never going to come back here again. Right? I had these great hopes that I was going to meet someone who's going to really kind of, I can benefit from. And the sheikh really took no interest in me whatsoever, <laughs> right? And he came across extremely strict. And I think this is something that maybe when you study his biography in more detail, you get to appreciate some of the reasons why that could have been the case. So I was completely put off. And uh, the, the sheikh who also brought me back, he said, look, don't worry, we've all gone through this process, right? He goes, at once, I, um, you know, I wanted to meet the sheikh. I you know, was doing some studies. So I ended up at the sheikh's house to you know, study from the sheikh. So I knock on his door and the sheikh opens up and he says, yes, what do you want? So he says, sheikh, I've come to meet you. Uh, did you make an appointment? Sheikh, no. Go back, make an appointment and come back next time. But I think that was important because it's this idea of seriousness, discipline, that you're dealing with someone that you have to take seriously. So now, my second visit now, right? The first visit is a disaster. So I'm, you know, reading Dale Carnegie and this kind of stuff. I need to come up with another approach to make this a bit more successful. So I said, you know what, I'll get this really nice gift, right? And maybe that would make the process a bit easier. So I purchased a small gift for the sheikh and I end up knocking at the door. The sheikh comes, obviously I'd arranged a meeting already in advance. The sheikh says, what's this? Stern look. Sheikh, uh, just a small gift for you. He says, I'd let you this time round, but don't you ever try and do that again. So, you know, from that point I realized that, you know what, it's not going to work. I can't use my methods of trying to win over the sheikh. I need to almost submit to what the sheikh is going to, um, you know, what's his expectations rather than the other way around. And, and I think once that happened, it, it became one of the, uh, you know, most kind of, uh, amazing experiences uh, with the sheikh. Now what I'll do is just talk about some of the aspects of the sheikh and then hopefully I can demonstrate some of that in, in some of the points I'll make later on. But there was a few key things that I found within the sheikh's personality. What is his uh, kind of, he was foresighted, he could almost see a problem that's going to come in the future and he starts working on it and the people around him don't really understand what he's, what he's doing. And you'll see this demonstrated through uh, a lot of the key things that he was working on. His ability to predict that there is an issue that's going to come within the coming near years. And I think even his book, The History of the Quranic Text, is a demonstration of that. That there's going to be people who will be, you know, the whole recent work that's been taking place in terms of the Quranic manuscripts that were rediscovered. And again, he has a whole discussion about how these manuscripts were hidden, even though they were available um, they were hidden from the rest of academia and until recently now kind of said, okay, we've got these manuscripts that don't go, uh, date back to uh, much earlier than we thought. And even though we told you that it was destroyed during the World War, actually they've still survived and we're going to be working on them. So he, uh, foresightedness was one thing. Secondly, his willpower and perseverance, this self-reliance and single-mindedness. And again, you see many episodes in his life which, you know, why did he go from, uh, from Mao to Delbend? And then why did he go, you know, running away, literally? And then from there to Al Azhar, completely in no place, you wouldn't expect him to be there. And then suddenly he's at a primary school library where there's literally two shelves of books, and that's his job to look after the library of a primary school. You know, you know now that we know who he is and what he did, but imagine looking at him at that time and thinking, you know, what's he doing here? But his uh, determination and willpower and perseverance was important. He was extremely focus-driven. He knew where he wanted to be, and he worked towards that path. It was as though it was quite clear where he needed to be. Uh, another key thing about the sheikh was original, uh, originality and creativity. The sheikh wasn't interested in repeating what other people had done. And that's why if you look at his works, it's this idea of what new contribution can I make uh, in this area. So even, you know, he was the first to publish the manuscript of Sohail ibn Abi Saleh, 
uh, a, a report, uh, you know, one of the manuscripts going back to Abu Huraira, he was one of the first ones to obviously talk about the scribes of the Prophet and add on to what was already existing knowledge. He was the first one to work on the manuscript of Sahih ibn Khuzayma that has a story in itself. He was the first one to publish the manuscript of Imam Muslims Tamiz. He was the first one to publish the Ilal of Ali al Madini. He was the first one to, even in terms of when you look at the ageless text of the Quran, the way it's been presented, again, it's a completely <coughs> different way of demonstrating the preservation of the Quran. So he's not, not this shows the creativity of the Sheikh. That, uh, and he's, he would repeat this out. The problem is that Muslims sometimes focus on you know, what to think, but not necessarily how to think. And, and that was something that was clearly demonstrated in his writings. Uh, the Muhaddithin uh, of Yamama, again, a new work that was not uh, found at all in early publications. One of the first ones to write about hadith in the English language uh, as well. And also one of the key works, that, inshallah, we'll, if we get time, we'll talk about, is his work on the computerization of hadith literature, which was a massive work that I think the vast majority of us are not fully aware of. Uh, he was a, a logical thinker and he was a deep thinker. You know, if you were to ask the Sheikh a question, he would remain silent for a minute or so, and then he'd start talking. So he was someone who, who took it quite seriously. Uh, my, my sessions with the Sheikh were primarily one-to-one. -one. And so beforehand, there would be certain texts that's okay, I'm gonna be asking the Sheikh questions on this text, and then go and then one by one go through the questions. And at times we just thought on the first question, and by the, by the time the time was over, initially I was told and I was warned to make sure that you punctual. Nine o'clock is the dead, you know, the cutoff line. Do not go one minute over nine o'clock or you'll be in big trouble, right? But alhamdulillah, after later on, the relationship became stronger, even though the, the reason for that was nine o'clock was his medication time. You know, again, he was someone who was seriously ill and needed medication, but still he was willing to give that time uh, to me. Uh, again, just to think about this, the kind of thinking, he was writing a work on the manuscript of the Ill of Ali uh, ibn Madini. And then, as part of the, uh, the manuscript, he came across uh, the writings of, uh, or the statement that was made of Yahya ibn Abi Kathir and how he was uh, one of the prolific hadith scholars and that he was even better, according to Shorah ibn Hajjaj, that he was even better than Imam al-Zuhri. But also the fact that Yahya ibn Abi Kathir spent most of his life in Yamama. So now the Sheikh is thinking, and even though he didn't write his book on the Muhadithin of Yamama was like a thought process that happened when he was doing the manuscript of the Ilan, where he said, a scholar of this prolific nature must have left a legacy. So why is it that there is no book that talks about the scholars of Yamama, right? And so it was that initial inquiry that led to him doing a work that demonstrated more than over 130 odd Hadith scholars who had based and lived in Yamama itself. Uh, also, uh, the the thirst for knowledge was something that was amazing within the Sheikh. Obviously his library was extremely impressive and it wasn't just limited to Hadith literature, he was reading all kind of texts. You know, every time I'd go to a Sheikh and he said, you know, I've bought this new book, it cost me 350 pounds or 500 pounds. The biggest frustration <laughs> for the Sheikh was that because it was Riyadh and again, you've got to remember 80s and 90s and so on, many of the books would get to the post office, but then it would never get to the Sheikh's house, right, because of the kind of uh, vetting processes at the time. So again, that was a frustration of the amount of books that the Sheikh bought, but uh, never get access to. The fact that even in his late age, he would be willing to learn new na uh, languages, right? The Nabataean script, he, wrote, he was 80 and he's learning a new script, right? Uh, the Sheikh would ask for me that, can you get me this German article and this German article? And I said, Sheikh, but I don't read German, uh, but also, do you read German? He goes, no, but don't worry, I'll get a dictionary and I'll work out what the article is saying. So the, he, was nothing, he was never afraid of uh, new knowledge. That <coughs> his studies in, uh, in, in biblical literature, New Testament and Old Testament studies, that happened later on in his life, 
right? But again, someone who is now starting to go into a new area, he was always willing to go into those areas that might be considered uncomfortable for many of us. Uh, he would say to me, to me and even many others that anyone who doesn't spend eight hours minimum of reading a day, he's not a scholar. Eight hours minimum. And he says that was his normal program. And in his later life, he would regret that even though he was spending quite a bit of time, but he had to move from his chair every 30 minutes. Right? So this was someone who was uh, uh, extremely... Uh, uh, dedicated to scholarship and his whole rise, uh, life was based on thorough investigation. He was never satis satisfied with his own works. You know sometimes there's a criticism, oh, okay, he said Ibn Khuzayma is not, Ibn Khuzayma is not to the standard, it should be, or even, you know, his uh, work, uh, uh, the edition of Ibn Majah wasn't mentioned, but that's one of the works that he also uh, worked on. Um, but again, uh, he realized that even the writing of Sahib Neo Khuzema was difficult for him because again, you're talking about 70s, 80s, where he said that he's in Mecca, the one who's checking it, Sheikh Albani, was in Sham, and it's being published in Lebanon. And there was no, almost no communication between the three in terms of what's the end result of the books and so on. That's why it went through uh, some editions as well. Some didn't even uh, uh, maybe understand why he did, for example, his Sun Ibn Majah, why he did it in the way he did, and why he relied upon certain manuscripts and not on others. Again, there was some criticism uh, about that particular work. But he would always, I think, in his introduction to the Muhaddithin of Yamama, he makes a point which demonstrates who he was. What he was trying to say was that this is not a complete investigation. And that if you look at all of his works, that's what he's trying to say. So even for the new to Lab al who said, oh, the Sheikh didn't do enough justice to the, you know, explaining the framework and so on. What he's saying is, okay, first read all of his works. But secondly, I'm, you know, he says that this is the first brick. And it's up to you to carry on. We've got the literature, we've got our tradition, but now you, you can't expect everything to be done by one person, right? Uh, you know, when he talks about even uh, some of the Orientalists, uh, when they wrote the concordance of the Quran, uh, sorry, of Hadith, you know, that was a, you know, a work that took many, many years and more than 30 different scholars coming together working on it. This was one man trying to do the best that he could. And what was important for him was academic precision, uh, precision investigation, and uh, methodological demands. You know, I would argue that he was a skeptic, right? And he was demanding, and what he would maybe potentially argue, that uh, the, some of the Orientalists were following a conspiracy theory in terms of, you know, the whole entire Muslim Ummah were just basically lying against one another, you know, uh, several centuries later producing a Qur'an which they all agree upon, and the whole Hadith literature, you know, Imam Malik, and all of these big Imams were liars. And again, it is true that the Shaykh sometimes in his writings maybe demonstrates a bit of frustration or anger, but you, can, you need to appreciate that in the context of several things. First of all, in the context of what the other people were writing at the time. And I think uh, Sheikh Soeb has already mentioned that if you look at most of the Arabic literature when it comes to defending, defining the head, you know, it's, there's so many books, the amount of money I still <laughs> wasted in some of these books because they were just repeating the same old stuff. And again, it wasn't the kind of scientific inquiry that you were looking for. So in that context, when you look at the Sheikh's work, it's almost like a, uh, like a miracle. Uh, but also, uh, the Sheikh was, I think his Deoban experience had a massive impact on him, without a doubt. And the Sheikh mentioned that many a times, that the, uh, the respect to the imma, right? Because again, it's this idea, you know, if someone swears at someone's mother, you can come as an objective middle person and say, you know what, you shouldn't do it like this, and maybe be polite and forgive him and so on. But if it's your own mother, then you're going to not treat the person in the same way. And the Sheikh had spent his life studying Imam Malik and you know, all of the famous Hadith scholars. And then when someone comes and says that this, you know, he was fraudulent and he was a liar and he was dece you know, deceiving people and so on, how much can you take that in a kind of moderate uh, academic kind of response, right? Uh, so 
I think that was another frustration. And obviously at that time you had Kulam Parwais, Abu Raya, Sidqi, Abdul Qadir, all of these in Egypt specifically. And again, it's interesting that his background in India, where there was a lot of hadith criticism going on, and also in Egypt as well, where there was a lot of hadith criticism going on, uh, had an impact in terms of the need to do a response, but an adequate response. And the argument, as was said, that this idea that, okay, Muslim responses are not scientific, so then he's saying, okay, which is the, it's almost like him saying, okay, which is the best university in the world, right? Cambridge? Okay, I'm going Cambridge, right? And I'm going to do a study which is based on the uh, scientific kind of procedures or methodology that they claim that it should be, and I will demonstrate the authenticity of the Hadith literature. And that's why I think what Murad Hoffman wrote uh, about the Sheikh, he did a, a small review of his history of the text of the Quran. And in it, he wrote, uh, he wrote that he took up the Orientalists on their own premises, on their own methods, literature, and lines of argumentation, revealing its biases, double standards, arrogance, incompetence, and ultra ulterior motives. For Muslims, this is easily the most important book of recent times. This is, again, Murad Hoffman, a German ambassador, who obviously had an interest in Islamic studies writing on this topic. What he was trying to say is that do, do whatever research you want. But please take Muslim history and Muslim heritage seriously. Because you're not, talking, you're not dealing with people who didn't know what they were on about. Uh, and, and this demand for scholarship was something that he was pressing from everyone, both Muslim scholars and also uh, non-Muslim <coughs> scholars. Uh, um, in other aspects of his life, his humility. Uh, he was someone who was clearly, I, I'm kind of mindful of time, I'm okay. He was someone who was clearly mindful, you know, about the Akhirah. I think that was his key focus. And again, for, for Muslim students and to love, you know, we hear about this in our writings of the early Aima and so on, but sometimes you, you feel that like it's missing uh, at times in contemporary uh, students, and it's something that, it was something that he would press quite a bit. He wasn't seeking popularity. He was in the midst of, you know, Riyadh would have conferences like every <coughs> other week, right? But he wouldn't attend many of these conferences. Even if you look at, uh, you know, he was asked many times to do uh, lectures in mosques and so on. But he, he wasn't looking for that kind of popularity. He was an academic and a researcher, and that's what he wanted to spend his uh, life in. Even the King Faisal, of, uh, King Faisal Award, which was uh, more than $200,000, uh, he donated all of that money uh, for young, uh, poor Muslim children who can benefit from scholarship. Even though I know for sure that Sheikh was in major debt at the time as well. Just as, uh, the, the, hopefully if I have time I'll talk about this, his, uh, his, the computerization project, roughly it cost, cost him over the years approximately five and a half million Saudi rials, right? Extremely, uh, a lot of costs, but you know, he just carried on doing the work that he was doing. He was extremely respectful, extremely uh, courteous. You know, the fact that he was willing to entertain me for so many hours, so, you know, a young guy, but, you know, no, and I, again, it wasn't just me. I think everyone who went, he was willing to give him the time. You know, sometimes, at the same time, in the university, at times I would say, okay, I want to meet the sheikh, we arrange a meeting, and then I'm literally waiting outside the office of the sheikh for an hour or two, and he doesn't turn up, and then next day I finally say, okay, well, I'm sorry, I was somewhere else. That never, it never happened with the sheikh. Every single time there was an appointment, he stuck by it, he never cancelled the appointment, and we were always, he would extend the time, but he wouldn't shorten the time. Uh, so he was someone who was extremely uh, humble and also allowing self-scrutiny. When his history of the text of the Qur'an came out, I literally went page by page through the book with the <coughs> sheikh and challenging him on some of his assumptions. Obviously at that time I did New Testament studies as well at Canada. So coming out from that background as well, challenging the sheikh on some of his positions. And there was not even one period in time where he became uneasy, got angry, Allowed, allowed me to ask him whatever questions that I wanted to uh, pose to him. He was someone who was extremely simple in his life, 
uh, you know, when you look at the way he lived and the kind of things that he was focused on, you know, he wasn't someone who was, you know, interested in what's, you know, in, you know, soap and programs and all that kind of stuff. He was someone who was dedicated to research. And so there was very little time wasting. Even when, even though I've spent 15 years with the Sheikh, to be honest, most of the information I found out about the Sheikh was through other people. Because when I, whenever I went and spoke to the Sheikh, he would sit down, he says, how are you? I said, alhamdulillah, I'm well. And he'd say, okay, 1964. And then he'd start, right? So there was not even five minutes that he would spend talking about, you know, how's your family and how's this and that. He was just focused on trying to pass on as much information as possible. Uh, as possible. He was extremely uh, jolly, cheerful, hospitable every time. You know, again, as a student, and at that time, initially, I was a bachelor as well, I would look forward to the sheikh's uh, meetings because he'd get the tea and samosas and all of that. Every single visit, he would do that for, for a young student as well, so someone who was uh, extremely accessible. When he found out that I used to, it normally used to take me about 45 minutes walk to get to the sheikh's place. So when he found out I was walking all the time back and then walking back, uh, he insisted that his son, Akhil, would drop me off all the, all the time. So he was, again, someone was extremely mindful that he didn't want his students or anyone to go through any kind of difficulty. What is clear that the sheikh was a family man, someone who was extremely dedicated to his family. And also, his family was extremely dedicated to him, uh, to him as well. It was a common thing, you know, normally we'd meet the, I'd meet the sheikh for Isha Salah at the local masjid. Um, and the sheikh would be struggling to walk, right? And so at times, uh, especially when Anas was there, you know, both sons holding the sheikh and taking him to the masjid and back. If not, then Akhil, uh, who was mainly with the sheikh, you know, holding the sheikh's hand and taking him for, to the masjid and back to the masjid and so on. So this was someone who, you know, the, the, the spiritual element and the ibad and, some, uh, and, and so on was also a critical part of the, of the sheikh's life. And I think... I, at this point, I want to quickly mention that I think uh, Dr. Akhil's role in the in the uh, in assisting the Sheikh can never be undermined because you won't find that. Of course, the Sheikh himself he would mention everyone who's helped him or contributed. Even the physician who was always with the Sheikh he would mention introduction that I want to thank the physicians and so on. So he would mention Dr. Akhil's role, but. Um, I know also that he, made, he played a phenomenal role in terms of, even when we talk about the programming of certain softwares for Hadith, uh, some of the researches and everything. Uh, and he is, uh, to a certain, even the students, because he's in the uh, Department of Computer Science, and the, even the students say that he's a genius, right? And again, this is the impact of the, of the father. And the, all these uh, uh, children had PhDs, right? They were all extremely academic, and alhamdulillah doing extremely well in the uh, professional field as well. Another thing that was a common conversation with the Sheikh was his extreme concern for the Muslims living in the West. He would constantly ask me, how's the Muslims in the West? When I would tell him, you know, especially after 9-11, some of the difficulties and challenges, he would stop for a while and you could see almost like tears, like, you know, there was a kind of, uh, for some reason, and again, it's because, you know, this is someone who spent time in Harvard, in Princeton, in Cambridge, in Oxford, you know, he was someone who had been in various different universities, Lampeter and so on. So he was extremely concerned about what happened to the Muslims uh, living in the West. Uh, he, he was also... He was hoping that the students were reading his works because I think that was quite important because he didn't write it just for the sake of writing it. And also in the Arab world, at least when he was writing his works, it wasn't a threat. Most people, you know, even just recently they've translated God Zahir, you know, in years later and they're doing a, a study on God Zahir and so on, right? Shaft, uh, it was only, uh, you know, recently that more works have been done on Shaft and so on. So they still don't understand the importance of this field of research. And so it was important for him that Western students were writing and reading these works and so on. I think also answering Dr. Swahib's uh, question, I think for him it was important that Muslims play a critical role in the Western academia. Um, and he was hoping, and he'd already seen the changes because before the, some of these writers or academics, when they were producing works, the blunders were so... Like it was major, major blunders. But what was now happening was that they were giving their works 
for proofreading to young Muslim students and others who check it to verify and some of these major mistakes were taken out. So that was already having an impact on the, uh, the end result of the research. But also the hope that Muslims would go back to the, a, a more serious inquiry within our Hadith literature. Um, so that they can have a, a critical impact. You know, again, this is a sheikh at the age of six or seven running away from home because he wanted to learn English, right? When at the time, you know, the very idea of learning English was looked down upon and even all of the scholars at the time were producing fatwa saying it's haram to learn English, right? And yet he is going to study English. And even at the age of 80, 85 onwards, he was still busy writing and producing works. From cradle to grave, if you want an example of contemporary cradle to grave, you find that in the writings uh, of the Sheikh, even though he had uh, severe concerns regarding his health as well. And it's important that we don't celebrate the Sheikh as a defender. I think that for me it's kind of quite important. He wasn't just someone who was kind of defending hadith. That's one work that he did. But he was a specialist in the, in the field of hadith. Right? And even Fadl Rahman's kind of comments are important because he, he had many debates with Fadl Rahman as well and he would tell me about this, you know, the discussions that he had because he felt that even Fadl Rahman was influenced by Shaf's writings as, uh, as well. And his, uh, many times he would say, an intelligent enemy is better than an ignorant friend. And what he was trying to say is that sometimes the Muslims are very kind of emotional, yeah, we want to defend the Sheikh and so on, but they've not researched, right? And, and therefore, they don't do justice, and it's important for them to take this issue seriously. The Sheikh, even when he was at Mecca, he uh, would teach masters, postgraduate students, um, uh, uh, scientific methodology. That was like the courses I would teach. And I think that kind of summarizes who he was. His criticism of Shaykh wasn't about, okay, you, you reject our hadith and so on. His criticism was the, the methodology that you are using is not a scientific methodology. And he was demanding academic scrutiny. That's what he was doing. Uh, and, and, and so that's an important point that he was trying to stress. That, okay, if you're trying to study hadith literature, then do it in an academic, uh, scientific uh, method. Uh, for him also, again, I think it's been mentioned a few times, towards the later stages, he became much more skeptical in terms of how much we can benefit from others uh, and um, a general mistrust of the nature of Western academia and scholarship. And I think a lot of these questions go even back to epistemology as well and how we understand what we know and, and, and so on. Uh, he would comment, again, taking the famous Hadith scholars, uh, understanding that he would say in the that would be something that he would say so many a times that this knowledge is in right or, or, or is religion so be careful who you take your religion from right and I, I think that's quite important even in our times as well uh, it, this was someone who was not just um, having an admiration of the Sunnah, but he was also living the Sunnah. We had once an interesting uh, situation where a famous kind of person from India came over. He's a very, he's quite an open proponent and criticizes hadith and so on. And the Sheikh noticed that he was drinking tea with his left hand. So he says that how can you comment on, on the Sunnah when you don't even know what the Sunnah is, right? And this was this idea of terbiya uh, that he wanted to emphasize uh, within the students as well. Uh, what was fascinating for me at times was uh, his memories of discussions with different Orientalists. So he would talk about Aubrey, he would talk about Sargent, um, he would talk about Michael Cook as well. They had interesting, you know, there was a debate that he had with Michael Cook about who is a scholar. Right, and you know, from a Muslim perspective, and so on. Uh, even I think, uh, if I recall correctly, even when it comes to Muslim scholars, you know, there was once he, uh, he was actually there when uh, Sheikh Al Qardawi and Sheikh Al Bani were debating the contemporary Sheikh Al Ghazali and his position on the Sunnah and so on. And he's like relaying that uh, story uh, to me. Um, uh, and again, obviously, this was someone who spent time with a lot of contemporary or famous scholars, especially the Umm Al Qura before the Sharia College, had some of these leading scholars there, Muhammad Qutub, Al Ghazali, and, and so many others who were teaching there at the faculty. So again, it was an, a, a, a great uh, 
situation for him to be in and uh, experiencing all of these differences. One of the things that I would also stress about the Sheikh, I have not met a scholar who said, I do not know more than Sheikh al adami Every time I would ask him, and he would be honest enough to say, that's not my specialization. He would, you know, when I'd say uh, Sheikh in Usul Fiqh or Sheikh in Fiqh and so on, even though obviously he'd studied and so on, but he would say, look, for the last 30 years I've been studying Hadith, Quran, Orientalism. Ask me those questions. If you want uh, fiqh and so on, there's many ulama in Riyadh, you can go and ask them that information. So someone who um, was extremely humble in the knowledge that he had, uh, even in his, obviously, Sahih ibn Khuzaym, uh, when he came out, he, he consulted Sheikh Albani for the hukum of the ahadith. Of course, in the last edition, I was taken out. But um, the fact that, and then he said that where I and uh, Albani differ, I've gone with Albani's position because he's an authority in this area. I am not an authority. Imagine someone writing that in pen, uh, you know, just again demonstrating the humility uh, of the sheikh. Uh, at the same time, also, he admitted that th there were other areas. So again, it's not this kind of uh, polemic and defender who you know, wasn't willing to consider areas of research. He would say openly that you know, that area requires more research. You know, that particular area is a problem we need to investigate, uh, and so on. Uh, he went into detail with Shaft because he wanted to demonstrate not just the theoretical framework, but the specific uh, inductive methods. Right? <coughs> Again, that goes back to this scientific method because again if you're he wanted to demonstrate that there's a problem in the way these are the Muslim sources are being used and that was the point that he wanted to make um, he was never he was an independent scholar he wasn't sectarian he wasn't you know that this scholar or this mother he would disagree with the scholars like he would disagree with Sheikh Bani but that wouldn't be a conversation for us to have in our in our meetings you know he would talk about Maududi, he would talk about Qardawi, Albani, eh, Abdul Hassan Nadwi, he would talk about Sayyid Qutub, Abdul Fattah, Abu Khudda again they were both in Riyadh as well uh, Ibn, Ibn Baz, Ghazali uh, also Mona Zakaria Khandawi who he met several times as well and had several discussions uh, even those who wrote scathing attacks on him, right, uh, including uh, including Dr. Bashar uh, Awad Ma'roof, and he called him Min Abna al Mustashriqin, right? You imagine to call someone like Sheikh Al Adami as Min Abna al Mustashriqin just because he came from Cambridge or he did his PhD in Cambridge. But the Sheikh didn't respond back in kind, right? Even though his response was a different kind, right? Because, uh, you know, they talk about. Why is the Hanafi contribution to the defending of the other imma and so on? Sheikh al adami did one of the best defenses of uh, Imam uh, Malik, and he's therefore, if you look at the introduction of the Muatta of Imam Malik, and the detail that he went into in terms of his biography, in terms of his students, and so on, it's am amazing. But also the fact that, because again, uh, Dr. Bashar was of the view, as was mentioned, that, you know, uh, he was focusing, uh, Imam Malik was more on riwayah uh, bil ma'na and not by, by love, and therefore he, want, he demonstrated through the different riwayahs to show that actually Imam Malik was precise in the wording of hadith that he used, right? So, a Hanafi scholar coming to the defense of a Maliki scholar, even though there were other Hanafi scholars like uh, uh, Imam Muhammad uh, Kothari. Uh, uh, who Zahid Kothay, who was of the view that the Muwatta was written much later because he wanted to almost indicate that uh, Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa, Allah, was an influence, right? He wrote a response to that to say, no, 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 actually, it was uh, Muwatta was around from the 19, uh, 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 140 onwards. So again, he wasn't partisan, he was an independent scholar. Where he ever, wherever he found the truth, he would follow the truth. And that was something that was demonstrated uh, throughout his writings as well. Uh, he would likewise defend the Aima, like even Ali ibn Madin in his Ilan, there was a discussion about him and Tadis and other things, and he would come 
to the defense of the sheikh in, of the hadith scholars as well. So he was someone who was independent, academic, interested in truth, but with a great appreciation of early Islamic scholarship. And I think that's the key point. So yes, he was independent, he was academic, he was interested in truth, like all of the Western scholars, but he had a great appreciation of uh, Islam, early Islamic scholarship because he spent years studying that early Islamic scholarship. Even when he had a criticism of a scholar, like for example, Dr. Uthman uh, Muafi in his book, uh, Manhaj al-Naqt al-Tariq in the Muslimin, he says that, you know, I think his conclusions are dangerous because it implies that the, uh, the Sunnah wasn't preserved. But I hope I have misunderstood the author, right? So again, this kind of humility. Um, I would argue that most of the writings of the Sheikh are still not published. Most of his work and research is still something that we haven't had access to, right? And I hope that at some time uh, it does get published. And I think, uh, although I'm extremely grateful to uh, uh, Ustad Andrew and the others for having this event uh, uh, in remembrance of the contributions of the Sheikh, but I think this needs a much greater uh, event where even Muslim academics produce you know, a, a work with chapters dedicated towards his specific contributions in all of these different areas, because all of these books, uh, I don't know, am, am I over? Are you sure? Okay, I'm mindful because I had a short time, I know a quarter, a quarter to, uh, we've gone half an hour over, uh, and also, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh, are you okay with your time? Okay, one of the things that people do not know much about is his work on the uh, computerization project. Anyone heard about the Sheikh's computerization project? Besides a few who are involved, right? So again, we know bits about the Sheikh, but we don't know, there's a lot of gaps in knowledge. Now, uh, the Sheikh has uh, produced some works which talks about this. So there's a short work in English that was part of the Journal of Islamic Studies in 1991 where he talks about what he had produced until that time. And then also there was a, another paper that he gave uh, for the Majma al-Fiqh al-Islami in, uh, I think, 1990, where in Arabic he may gave, gave a bit more details. And then privately when I was with him, he gave a bit, a bit more details as well. And his whole idea was that how can we preserve the Qur'an and the Sunnah, right? That's his objective throughout his life, right? And so, um, when he was studying at Cambridge, he first came across, and this is in 1964, he came across this idea of religious texts being used as part of uh, computer, or using the computer to study religious texts. So that was an initial thought, but at that time he didn't think that this would also happen to Muslim literature, Hadith and Quran and so on. Because again, nowadays, you know, just recently, I think maybe two, three years ago, someone wrote an article saying that we shouldn't benefit from Maktab al and these kind of online resources because the early ulama were reading books and when you go through books, the benefit you find from there, you won't find from the Shamila and so on. I think this is such an outdated understanding. Um, and, and this is what I mean when I say the Sheikh was far beyond his age, right? He, maybe even now, in terms of his views, he was considered to be advanced, even though these were views that he had from the 60s and onwards. So in 1975, there was a conference in Chicago where one of the uh, Orientalists talked about the potential use of uh, uh, computer research in the field of Hadith. And sh straight away, alarm bells went off in the head of the Sheikh. Because the Sheikh is wondering that if Muslims don't take a role in this, there is a potential, he, was, he even had the title already ready, you know, the latest discoveries through uh, computer studies in the field of hadith and, you know, all of the problems that they had and so on. So the Sheikh said, you know, I need to be at the forefront of this, right? Again, 1975, these discussions, right? So in 1977, uh, uh, there were some students or, or some lectures from Riyadh, they came to uh, America and they did some basic studies on, on the Sunnah, but nothing really transpired. And then he realized that he needed to take, uh, become more forth, uh, you know, uh, forthright in terms of taking this area uh, seriously. So. In 1978, uh, when he was in Riyadh, he went to the 
College of Computer Science, right? And this is a Hadith scholar, Mulana, right? Who is now, rather than being in the science or in Islamic studies, is now coming to the computer science to say, do you know what? I want to learn how to use a computer, right? And in those days, as you know, there was these big, big machines, right? And um, so, in 1978, the Sheikh bought his own uh, uh, terminal or computer, so that that, it, that would allow basic data entry. Um, but he didn't have all of the Arabic letters. So obviously that was a big problem. And at that time it cost him 30,000 riyals to purchase this uh, computer. And then he soon realized that this wasn't good enough. So in 1979, uh, he bought the Hewlett Packard, uh, even I don't even know these, some of these, uh, you know, 1,000 mini, mini computer. And it cost him 300,000 riyals at that time. And he began work in earnest. So now when he was presenting some of his or initial kind of, uh, he presented uh, a paper uh, in, I think in Qatar, where he said that Muslims need to take, uh, in, in, you know, be involved in this area of computerization of hadith. And no one took interest, and no one came forward and said, okay, we'll back you with money, and it's a massive project, and so on. And in our times, again, there's many projects that we could do, and we feel it's massive, but then it's okay, if there's no funding available, I'm not doing it, or if there's not 20 people ready to take part, then uh, forget it, it's too much of a work. He didn't consider any work, uh, you know, that he couldn't do, right? Uh, no challenge was too great for him. So, in 1980, uh, some basic uh, preliminary results through his work, uh, he created a concord concordance of a small collection of hadith, and that was submitted at the King Faisal International Award. And then in 1981, again realizing that his HP 1000 wasn't good enough, uh, he bought a more powerful HP 3000. Um, and that cost him almost one and a quarter million Saudi uh, riyals. And that was then used as his first results for his, uh, for his uh, work on Ibn Majah, right? Uh, because uh, that, that new edition was based on his research on uh, this uh, whole computerization project. And the last two volumes of the work <coughs> was basically typeset directly by the computer. Again, nowadays, when we talk about type typesetting and so on, we, we've got advanced kind of software and so on. But imagine in that time when it was uh, much more challenging. And he said that the main <coughs> objective for him was to do a scholarly study of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu through this particular project. He initially thought that in the same way you've got the Mu'jim al-Fahris, the al-Fad al-Qur'an, that he wanted to do something similar uh, in, in, uh, in hadith as well. And obviously at that time you had, uh, sorry, the, uh, the one by Wenzig on Majum uh, al-Mufahis al-Hadith, but he wanted to do something that was done by the Muslims. Now, in the early stages, so what's the first thing that you have to do when you're trying to put computer hadith data into the computer? So this is my first interaction point, <laughs> just to make sure that you're following me. Right, so you know, we could have said, do you know what, okay, we need to enter the hadith into the <coughs> software. So what we're going to do is let's get all of these different publications of these different books, or so wherever the prints are available, and stop putting that data in. The sheikh said no. The sheikh said what I'm going to do is, I'm going to compare it all with manuscripts, because <coughs> 40 years down the line, 50 years down the line, 100 years down the line, they're going to say, okay, but you, all this data that was put in wasn't based on early manuscripts of hadith, it was later works, and therefore it doesn't mean anything. <coughs> so then the Sheikh's journey for the study of hadith manuscript began, and that's a, an amazing journey in itself. You know, his visits to Turkey and his visits to uh, uh, Maghreb and various other places, right? <coughs> Even when he discovered, I'm trying to imagine the situation, right, where he's going to Turkey, he's going to uh, he knows that several other groups have already been <coughs> to the museum, they've looked at all of the manuscripts available, they've tried to put them in different orders and so on. So then he himself says that I wasn't expecting to find anything, because obviously others have come before me, and they would have done the work that was already there. But that, that skepticism <coughs> or that you know, doubt, right, man had a tashkik, this idea that no, I want to find out, maybe they've missed something. And so when he uh, went and he's going through the works, he f comes across this manuscript and he's suddenly showing interest and then he soon realizes 
that this is the manuscript of Sahib the Khuzayma, a book that until that time had never been published, right? So again, and he says that this was Tawfiq min Allah, yeah, the fact that you know, out of all of the people, right, he was chosen to be able to find this particular manuscript. Um, uh, and then obviously he had that published as well. He said that just for Sahih, uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, he found over a hundred manuscripts just in Istanbul. So then that's the next step. But again, he's a textual critic, right? When you talk about textual criticism, this idea of, okay, you've got tons of manuscripts, but then what do you do with these manuscripts? Because not all of them are of the same value. And then also the other challenge is how can you get microfilms from the museums? Because some are, again, extremely... You know, they don't want to share some of the information and so on. Then the other thing that you would notice, again, looking at these different manuscripts, that they were, some of them had actually signatures at the bottom of every single page demonstrating the sama'at or the people who had actually heard the hadith or the qira'at, the people who had actually uh, uh, heard the hadith as well. Um, and then he wanted to, therefore, he wanted to verify what's in the manuscripts to what is available in the uh, current prints as well. And through that process, he found that there were many mistakes in some of the printed editions of the Hadith literature, even in terms of Musnad Imam Ahmed, he, felt that he found certain manuscripts that included a Hadith that wasn't found in the print version of Musnad Imam Ahmed. Even in terms of uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, again, he found uh, certain early manuscripts with reading notes, signatures, and so on. And so he came up with a methodology of how he's going to, which manuscripts he's going to prioritize. So the manuscript had to be a complete work primarily. Uh, he, he did want apocryphal works, later kind of attributions. Uh, he wanted the mentions of names of Sama'at on every page as one way of authenticating that the work was um, from these early scholars. So, for example, the copy of uh, Sahih Bukhari, their signatures from uh, Al-Iraqi, Al-Haythami, uh, Abu Zur'a, Ibn Sayyid al Nas and others. You know, imagine you finding works with manuscripts with these kind of uh, uh, important features. Uh, the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, more than 20 manuscripts that he was able to find from the 4th to the 10th century. And again, he didn't want to take anything beyond the 10th century. And he also felt that some of the public, uh, uh, publications were focusing on manuscripts that were based on 12th uh, century onwards, uh, which was uh, a slight concern <coughs> for him. And then he did this with also Imam Mus uh, Sahih, uh, Muslim, uh, and Nasai to a certain extent, Abu Dawood, uh, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and others. So then what he did, the process is, and I'm, not ta I'm taking quite a bit of time, uh, he wanted, uh, the first thing is storing this information into the computer. So he did the Musnad Imam Ahmed, again, whilst comparing with manuscripts as well. And I think uh, also, uh, Sheikh Akram, since he's here, he also, I think, was also part of that uh, checking of manuscripts and so on, so I'm sure he, he will have much more beneficial things to say on that project as well. Uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, uh, Sunan Nasai, Abu Dawood al-Tirmidhi, uh, Ibn Majah, Matarib al-Aliya, uh, Ithaf al-Sa'ida, Mu'jam al-Kabir of Tabarani, uh, Muwatta of Imam Malik, Jami Sahih, and then also he started to uh, put into the computer translation, so translation of Sahih bukhari in English, so this is in this 70s and 80s when we, we thought it wasn't even around, right? English, uh, Pushtu, uh, Bengali, Hindi, French, German, Malay, and so on. Uh, also, uh, 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 bibliographical works as well. So, Taqrib al-Tahdib, Ta'jil al-Manfa, Tahdib al-Kaman. He started putting all of this data into the computers as well. Dictionaries as well. Also, other relevant, uh, relevant works, Tartib al-Asma al-Sahaba, and so on. Uh, and then he also mentioned, and this was done later on, that he would be adding the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, the Sunan of Darimi, other translation hadith works, all, all of that uh, into the project. Now, I just want to briefly mention some of the problems that he came across. The first thing was that obviously you're trying to put Arabic scripts into these computers, and at that time the computers wouldn't allow Arabic script. So that was already a, straight, a problem. Now, again, this is, my point is that demonstrating that hurdles will come in your way is what you do with those challenges. And you will see with the sheikh that no matter what hurdle that came in front of him, he was looking at ways to overcome those challenges. So, 
Uh, because what he wanted to do, his grand plan was that, you know, uh, th through this process, he would be able to do takhrij of hadith, he would be able to mention, put into a computer this narrator, he would know all of the narrations that he reported, the isnad chains, madar al-hadith, all of that, right? And this was, he was talking about this in the 70s, uh, when we, obviously, most of us weren't even born, right? And, but then what happened uh, is that, there, there was a problem with the, first of all, there was a problem with the Arabic itself. So he had uh, proposed that uh, there was a, a company in America who would potentially produce a software to allow for Arabic script writing. So the Sheikh went all the way to America to have a discussion with these guys to see if you can create that software. Uh, they initially said yes, and they were again asking for almost like a quarter million or something. Uh, the project started, and after a few months, they gave up. They said, you know what, we can't do this. So then the sheikh said to his son that, you take over, and you do it. So now his son, he was also doing his studies at university as well in computer science. So his son is the one who actually created the first software, right? And then later on, you had another problem, because then the new features came about, where you could put diacritical marks in, in the hadith text. And that was an important feature to add but then he'd already spent years putting all of these hadith books in. Now to redo it again, he said it would take him another 15 years to put all the diacritical marks, Fathah al Makasra and so on. So then what do you do? So then the sheikh suggested to his son, so that we create a program that will automatically put diacritical marks on the text of the hadith. But then, how does a computer, how, you know, what, what kind of program are you going to create that will be able to do that? But again, that's something that they started to do with his son, and they created a program, again, looking at certain features within uh, Arabic wording, that would allow for almost like a guesstimation, or guessing of the kind of diacritical marks. And he said 80% of the results were positive, right, once the computer did this automatic uh, diacritical marks. But he said the 20%, was a complete joke and he would laugh at some of the results because you know the Fatha Dhamma would be put at different places. So then that would require another review, another checking. And then new computers came out with different brands. So one software that would work on one computer wouldn't work on another computer. Then another problem was the storage, right? Because this is before the days of DVDs and CDs and so on. So even the computers that you had 100 megabytes and it's like, okay, there's no more storage space, right? Even though in our times, that's nothing. So then the CDs came out, so now he wanted to make sure that it can benefit from So this was someone who was, you know, checking the latest research in computer science and so on, and using that in the field of Hadith studies. Whilst everyone else uh, wasn't aware of all of these different things that were going on. Um, <coughs> I'm going to try and cut it short. I won't uh, go through all of these different points. But the whole idea was that this was uh, the, the kind of work, uh, there was bits or small work or, or CDs that came out that showed some of the work that the Sheikh had produced through this 20 years of research. But a lot of it is still not published nor available. And I think obviously there was financial constraints there was also this kind of dedication that the Sheikh felt that, okay, he needed to now move on because he saw Quran as a, you know, the last 20 years of the Sheikh's life was focused on Quran studies. Um, but also then he realized there are other people now coming into the market, people with millions, and also there were groups of teams who are now working on it. So he felt, okay, others have now come in this area, I need to move away from this, and I need to now uh, go into another area. But, um, if it was released, if all of his work was released in maybe in the 80s, then I think, you know, even the students that were at the time there, they would say that it was like sorcery, right? Because even in terms of searching of a hadith, right, he was looking at those problems. That, okay, if you put a word in, but because if, you, if you're not putting the triliteral root, then you're not getting all of the results. You're only getting certain verbs and you're not getting others. So then how can we... He said that I taught, the, or his son taught the program Arabic grammar and morphology, right? So that now it's able to identify word searches and that you can use and and or and then detect certain uh, hadith uh, from, through that process. Um, he then talks about in his research some of the potential outcomes that he wanted 
he was anticipating, uh, both in terms of location of a hadith in specific books, uh, location of prime narrators of Sahabas, the biographies of different specific narrators, uh, list of possible meanings, because he was also adding on dictionaries within this research method as well. Uh, digitalized pictures of the manuscripts, uh, tree diagrams that would spread the hadith from different narrators and chains, audio recordings of some Arabic hadith as well, so we were talking about adding audio, information about hadith uh, books. Are we okay with time? Okay. Uh, uh, and so on. There's like a, literally a, a whole list of 20, 30 features that he was hoping. Alhamdulillah, now through the Maktaba Shamil and through other softwares, we're starting to see some of these things. But the Sheikh was working in this field 20, 30, 40 years before the others got into the picture. And so when I say the Sheikh was forward thinking, you know, and someone who had foresight and so on, I think that was a great demonstration of. How, the kind of foresight and the kind of work because you can imagine even the students would mention that when he used to come to the following dates of university the sheikh's eyes were like red with blood right it was clear that the sheikh had slept very little the night before because what he was most likely doing was going through these manuscripts looking at these hadith and adding that data into the computer uh, and so on for many many years and so when he says he spent eight nine ten hours just sitting, reading, that was something, this is someone who lived with our hadith literature. Today, even people who are writing PhDs and so on, the, the kind of literature review that they're doing compared to the work that the sheikh did is just not comparable. And that's why this need for taking our heritage more seriously by going back to our traditions. I'm just going to end with just one small section, a small discussion, because I think it's Important. He has one book which is called Manhaj al Naqt in uh, the which is uh, the hadith criticism of the hadith scholars. And here he's focusing on not just tech or isnad criticism, but also textual criticism. Because again, this assumption that Muslim scholars didn't want to deal with textual criticism. And that also that they were, you know, rationality and logical thinking and critical thinking was something that they didn't want to consider as part of that process. And so I think his work, uh, which was like an introduction to the book Tamiz, again, that was initially parchment, now we've discovered more works on, on, on that book. But he wanted, uh, because this is the biggest and most important point, that the kind of stuff that the sheikh was researching is not something that's spelled out for you black, black and white in our books, right? It requires someone with deep familiarity with the early text. And that was his kind of criticism of later Muslims as well. Like the uh, comparison he would give is that when the early Muslims, uh, when someone's about to build a house, right? He would buy the best material, you know, making sure he's very precise in terms of the bricks that are being used, the cement, the doors, and every single thing is very precise because he wants it of a certain standard. But once the house is built and the edifice is there, then once he passes that ownership to someone else, the next person that comes in says, okay, I don't need to go through that same level of scrutiny as the original person. And he says that this is a similar kind of thing that the early Hadith critics and scholars were scrutinizing everything. And, and that later on, there was a bit of leniency in terms of, uh, you know, it's clear in the whole debate of the Mutaqaddimin, Mutaqhirin, it's clear where he stands in that debate, right? Um, uh, that the, there was a bit more leniency when it came to later Hadith scholars, even when it comes to, you know, who's a Hadith, can, you know, what age someone can transmit a Hadith and so on. And this is a problem that most of the students who are now studying Hadith are primarily learning their Hadith through the writings of later scholars, which isn't to undermine the importance and the need to benefit from those works. But at the same time, you can't ignore our early heritage as well and looking at the writings of the early Hadith scholars as well. And so, uh, in, in this book, he wants to demonstrate, because uh, he actually did a kind of quiz or survey with the students. He asked the students that when, these, when the Hajj season comes, because he was in Mecca, he said, when these scholars come to you, ask them that when a, a scholar in his book, in the Kutub al-Rijal, when he says, uh, you know, that so-and-so is thiqa, you know, adopt and, you know, imam and da'if and so on, what, how did they come to those decisions? Right? 
And, and, and he'd get funny responses from students. Some students would say, oh, Sheikh, I asked so and so, and he said it's Il Ilham, right? His intuition that was given to the Sheikhs, and you know, that's how it was done. And he said, no, I want to demonstrate that there was a scientific method by which, and he, what he was trying to say is that this Qutb al-Rijal is the end result. And the problem is that nowadays the students are starting from the end result Right? He's saying that these books are the fruits of the hadith criticism and not the hadith criticism in and of itself. Right? It's like someone who goes to a university just four or five years, at the end he gets a two one or a first. Right? When he's going for a job and so on, he can say I got a first from this university and so on. But there was a whole process before that that took him to that place. And it's important to identify what that process is was. So what the, the, the Sheikh does several things uh, within his uh, book. Uh, he, he wants to demonstrate the critical methods that were used by Hadith scholars, both in terms of Islam criticism and also Matan criticism. And he said, I can see some of the fruits of the Sheikh's thinking, even in some of the students, his students who are still uh, elderly Sheikhs now, even though they may not categorically state it. Like one of the students uh, of the Sheikh wrote a brilliant research paper on uh, textual criticism used by Hadith scholars. In another work, it was um, how um, the uh, Qutb al-Rijad, right, how you can still identify the reliability of Hadith scholars uh, through a study of, uh, you know, Isnad Matan, you know, Matan kind of analysis, right? <laughs> so, and, and, and did demonstrate this, that, you know, you, you now actually, you know, so even these later biographical works, th that can still be scrutinized. It's not that this idea that it's beyond scrutiny. It can easily be scrutinized. All you have to do is you look, look at the teacher, look at the students, right? If there's a contradiction in the kind of reports between the students, then it's either the teacher is saying something wrong and is inconsistent over a period of time, or that there's a problem with the students. And now there's a mechanism to now determine is the problem with the student or is the problem with the teacher. If the problem is with the teacher, then that will then give you an idea of what kind of grading you can give that particular teacher in his report of hadith. Right? So uh, this was fruits that were, the sheikh was putting in the minds of the students. And I think there's still a lot of work in this area that still needs doing, especially the whole area of ilm. Right? And the kind of fruits are there in that particular area. In the English literature, there's very little that's been written in that area. And, and also, we need to take uh, Muslim scholarship seriously, even including Arab scholarship. There are certain Arab scholars currently doing works in areas which may not be directly linked to all kind of field of Western Hadith criticism, but we can, through a thinking process, you can benefit from some of their results as well. Uh, just a few kind of points as to what he does in this book. So he, he talks about the role of intellect in hadith studies. Uh, even the definition of a sahih hadith has two elements, which is to do with almost mutton criticism, right? Shad and illa are both elements. So even though the isnad seems brilliant, there's the hadith scholars were using other methods to demonstrate a weakness within the hadith as well. So it wasn't a purely reliance on, on the isnad itself. Uh, so he talks about the history of hadith criticism, showing that how even during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there were methods that were being used to verify hadith, even during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And he gives examples of that. Obviously, at that time, with the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> the verification required is not the same verification as required in the second century. But the fact that that process was already there. The, and then he talks about mistakes and the nature of mistakes. Uh, he talks about the necessity of hadith criticism. That, you know, this is a science that needs to be taken seriously. Uh, and again, this is something when you look at later hadith works, you, you don't see that seriousness in terms of early hadith criticism. The motivation behind hadith criticism, because so a lot of the sheikh's works has elements of sociology and psychology as well, anthropology, trying to understand the nature of human beings and what would there be their, what would their, what would be their, their response in a certain <coughs> scenario. Right? And how could it be that these people who are going around attacking everyone, that you're da'if in hadith, and you're da'if in hadith, and you're weak, and so on, but at the same time, the, they're the biggest fraudsters, right? <laughs> Fabricating the largest amount of hadith, as 
the, some of the uh, Western Orientalists were trying to indicate. So then he talks about another key element, which is uh, Adana, integrity, right? <coughs> and again, that he uh, tries to demonstrate has an importance when it comes to hadith criticism. And even in our times, even when we're taking ilm, Adana is something that's important and needs to be also considered. He talks about fisk, how do you identify fisk and you know the kind of methods that we use. Um, like even when he did his study of the muhaddithin of Yamama, he talks about in his research he couldn't find any of the people in Yamama who were <coughs> accused of bid'ah, of irja, of i'tizal, of qadr, and none of them. But he was thinking in that kind of way as well in terms of the identification of these different narrators. Um, the accuracy, so uh, adopt quantitative assessment. Uh, comparing memorization with written reports. Then he talks about the rules of the intellect. And he also, uh, Wang Mi was someone quite important, uh, you know, he would refer to quite a bit as well. And he talks about how um, uh, rational and critical thinking was used in the listening of hadith, in the writing of hadith, in the comparing of hadith, and even in the narrating of hadith. So, you know, sometimes there's this kind of approach that all rationality has no space, space in Islam and critical thing and so on. He tried to demonstrate that it was actually utilized at every single juncture when it came to hadith uh, criticism. And then he talks about the sahabas and the integrity and orientalist criticism and so on. There's still lots to say about the sheikh, but I hope in, in this short presentation, I've just given you a glimpse into the life of the sheikh and the kind of things that he did. But I think the most important thing for the sheikh wouldn't be just a remembrance of who he was and what he did. What was most critical, and it, to be honest, he saw that in Western students or students living in the West. He felt that they were the ones who were gonna carry on that legacy, right? This wasn't a, uh, 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 you know, he did, that he wasn't appreciating the role of scholars in the Arab world and so on. He understood that they had a role and so on. But he felt that the, the Western, Western Muslim students had a great role to play in the field of hadith studies and they can take his legacy by carrying on that research that he laid the first brick on and it is for us to carry on building that brick. <laughs> Jazakallah khairan for a fantastic overview of uh, Sheikh Azmi's um, character and his, uh, his scholarly and the importance of his scholarly output. If I could now uh, welcome Sheikh Akram, please, uh, to uh, come up. And um, it follows on great, I think it, his, his follow on is great to the conclusion that we just heard. Um, introducing Sheikh Akram is always quite difficult. It's, it's almost like like if I have an event and I have Cristiano Ronaldo here, and I say, oh, you know, this is a great it's Cristiano Ronaldo, and he's a great football player, it probably doesn't um, match up to things. So you know, Sheikh Alkham doesn't need an introduction from me, really. So he's one of the biggest scholars that we have uh, in the West. In many ways, um, Sheikh Alkham reminds me of Sheikh Azmi. And when I when, when I when I remember Sheikh Azmi when I met him, he was very unassuming very unassuming, um, but his knowledge was deep and his character was very deep. And even to the end when we were working on this history of the Quranic text, I was sending him material and saying, look, I think we should discuss this with the, these uh, articles or these books, these are the main points in them. And I wasn't sure, he was incredibly ill, you have to remember he was like almost 90 years of age. And I wasn't sure if he was going to respond or even look at the things. But then he was then asking for more material that I haven't even mentioned. So, you know, he, he said, oh, you know, have, have, have you got you know, Shona's book on the genesis of literature in, in um, early Islam? And he was frustrated with that book, because again, he would say that it's a book which um, ignores my studies in early Hadith literature, ignores my edition of uh, Maghazi, Orwa ibn al-Zubayr, um, although he refers to the, uh, the, the edition that Azmi uses, yeah. he refers to it. But um, if Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Akram could come and give us some words on the legacy of, of Sheikh Azmi, how we can take it forward. <coughs> Uh, 
الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه معين ما بعد ما جاء بردا فسست الحمد لله وبلسان أستاذ أندرو بوسو and Dr. Suhail and Dr. Sheikh Imtiaz uh, about the contribution of uh, our dear Sheikh Mustafa Adami uh, in the field of Hadith and also the Quran. Uh, my relation actually with the Sheikh is uh, uh, very old and recently I've written two articles about uh, Sheikh one in Arabic to so some of his biography and <coughs> some other details and one in Urdu. My relation with him goes uh, to the year 1983 when I was studying Sahih Bukhari in Nazat al Ulama. Uh, in that time, my teacher of Bukhari was Maulana Ziaul Hassan Azami. So he was contemporary and colleague of Sheikh Mustafa Azami. Uh, and Dr. Mustafa Azami was that time involved in what Sheikh Intaz mentioned about computerization of the Hadith works. So he did the Sahih Bukhari that time. So he sent the whole manuscript. Uh, and, uh, and the proof uh, to Nazrat ulama to my teacher. So my teacher asked me to compare the whole thing with him. So that the first time I was involved in the project, uh, so I did this uh, with him in the whole Sahih Bukhari. Then after that, in 1986, I came to Riyadh, uh, King Saud University, for a, in a short period, for just four months. Uh, though I spent most time with Sheikh Al-Fatah, but I also spent some time with uh, Dr. Mustafa Azami, and I work again with his project of the computerized of the Hadith, uh, as long as I study in, in Riyadh. So Alhamdulillah, that actually, the, you know, that was for me also a good experience how to study the manuscript, how to compare the Hadith works. Sheikh Mustafa Azmi, as Dr. Andrew Boso has mentioned, uh, comes from Adamgar. And that is Eastern UP, where I come from. Jawanpur, Adamgar, Jawanpur actually used to be the capital of this province. Now it is no more, but in the past it used to be. And Azamgar has produced so many ulama. Our Sheikh Abu Rasulullah Rahmullah used to say that in India, in among every three learned people, one must be from Azamgar. That is to say, that among every three, three learned person, some one person is from Azamgar. And you can see that in the Hadith scholarship in our time, Mawala Hayyur Rahman Azami was from there, Rahmullah Ta'ala, then Dr. Mustafa Azami. And then also Sheikh Yunus Jawanpur, it's all the same region. So they from a Hadith field. In the Quran, that is the region which produced Mawlai uh, Farahi. Hamidun Farahi, Allah Ta'ala comes from, from, from there. And actually, Mawlai uh, Rasulullah Ta'ala used to say, and also many people, India had only produced two people who could write good Arabic. Only two people. One is Mawlai Dehlevi, and one is before him, Mawlai Mahmud Jawanpuri. He also from the same reason. Two people who could write proper good Arabic. Most people who write Arabic, the Arabic is more artificial, you know, more like Musajjah, Muqaffa, like Maqamat al-Hariri, you know, not actually eloquent. But if you read uh, in Mahmud, uh, Mullah Mahmud Janpuri or Mullah Dehri, so you can't feel that you know, they are not Arabs, you know, like pure, pure Arab people. Uh, among the uh, uh, you know, last uh, important people actually in, in that region was no doubt, Mawla Shib bin Omani. Allama Shib bin Omani, who was born in the year 1857 and died in 1914. Uh, you know, he actually, in many, many aspects, is one of the main pillars of in Islamic education in India. Uh, in Urdu literature, we say there are five pillars for Urdu literature. One is Sajid Ahmad Khan, one is Khaja Al-Taf Hussain Hali, Nadir, Dipti Nadir, uh, you know, and then, the fifth one is Allama Shib Nu'mani. The five people, he's the only person who is from the East. All of them are in our daily, he's the only person. Mawla Shib Nu'mani, you know, he's grown up, he studied Hadith, Bukhari, and all those things, you know, in, with big, big people. Then he traveled the Muslim world. He went to Turkey, spent a lot of time, you know, in Istanbul. He wrote his travel journey, uh, you know, Safar Namay, Rum Misro Sham, which I did translate into Arabic language, Alhamdulillah, published. Uh, so, uh, Mawla Shivli, when he came back, he has uh, you know, good uh, knowledge of what happening in the Muslim world. So one of his projects was uh, Orientalism. He wanted to really deal with this matter, the questions raised by Orientalism. Because he also accompanied them in Aligarh and many places. He has some good friendship with them. And he understood their work properly. And what they have done good and what are their something negative. So for that purpose, he established Dar al in Nalanba, which only was able to work after his death. 
And though there are three main objectives of Darul Sunni. The first one was to study the questions which have been raised and challenges which have been imposed by the Orientalists and to answer them properly. So that is one thing. Second thing is we should produce original works on Sira and history of Islam, you know, a kind of, you know, on the best academic standard, you know, without looking any question, best you know, possible works. So that they also did, no doubt, say to Nabi and Tariq al Islam and all those things that in initial work without any looking any question or answer, just produce them. So the second objective. Third one was to train the writers, good Muslim writers. Because you can see in, in our mother side, even actually now, if you go to Deoban, Sahara, and Bur, even in this country, and I'm going to come to that later on, anyway, inshallah, to compare you know, what happened now and what Mustafa Admi has done, Rahmanullah Ta'ala. If you read the writings of ulama from Deoban, from Sahara, from Pakistan, even people actually don't make effort to write proper footnotes, not proper references. Until now, what is going happening is they refer to hadith, they will quote Kazaf al Mishkar. Do Mishkat actually not to work, you know, you cite for Hadith, you have to go to Bukhari, to Muslim, to original sources, not to Mishkat. So, you know, laziness in the scholarship, not proper, you know, uh, in, not the right way of the scholarship, that you, know, you go to the earliest possible source. Very often what they do, actually, they go to the latest, you know, uh, possible sources. So, Mawar Shibli introduced this methodology in Darul Sanifin, that was the ulama are trained to write properly a kind of academic standard, and then now they, they produce it. You know, so much work in Urdu language, uh, Alhamdulillah. And uh, his concern of uh, Orientalism was so much uh, that uh, always in Darul Sanifin have been few ulama who have been working on that, that aspect. Until they, uh, they organized in 1982, in February 1982, uh, an international conference on Orientalism for three days where the scars came from Arab world, from, from Europe, from America, from everywhere. And uh, Alhamdulillah, they produced good works uh, and good papers uh, in, 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 in that conference and, and, and then they published, published them. So I, uh, you know, no doubt, Mustafa Adli's work is the extension of Shibli's project. The Shibli's project was this, uh, to study those questions. That's why he used to say that, you know, now people now study the Kalam and Aqaid, but they keep discussing the same questions which was raised by philosophers, by Mu'tazila. They don't understand the questions of our time. He said, new al-Kalam should be the, the questions that are raised in our time. And questions which are raised in our time are questions related to the Sira the Prophet, to history of Islam, to the Quran. Not about this, the Quran, Makhluk, or where Makhluk, and what Yad means, what Hain means. You know, these questions will be outdated. Tomorrow she wanted to, you know, train all of us to understand the modern questions. <coughs> the most, Dr. Mustafa Azmi, when he came to Europe, he understood this thing properly. He wanted to understand it. He wanted to make himself relevant to the society, to his time. So he produced his work, and no doubt is really one of the pioneering work in, in the Hadith literature, you know, from the Muslim point of view. Though it had been ignored, and I'll come to that if I have time, inshallah, why it had been ignored, but it no doubt is one of the solid, proper scholarly work which has been produced by any Muslim in our time, Rahimullah Ta'ala. What I want to emphasize here more is, see his background. He had been raised in an Indian small town, Mau, Mau Nath, Mau Nath Anjar, which many people don't know. That is his town. Mau, I have been there. And from the same town is also Mau Rahim Rahman Arjumi. A small town, not very developed. And then after that, he studied in Deoband. Deoband actually had no concern about Europe and about America. Deoband concern always had been Indian. Actually, it came after that, you know, that, that period of time, more defensive Islam. But then he comes to other, then he comes to, you know, to this country. Now he wants to see really what happened in the world. He wants to make himself relevant to his time. But what happened in our time is really most people, many, many ulama, they came from India, they stayed in this country. Actually, many of them established their room. But still people who come from these dark rooms, they are more relevant to a village in India rather to this country. The same mentality, same discussion, same argument, you know, same questions they discuss. You know, they have no relevance to the society here. You know, whatever they write, actually, nobody is concerned to read them. What they discuss, nobody is concerned about that. This actually is not right way of education. Actually, Iqbal has said very nicely, Kar sakte the jo apne zamane ki imamat, wo kohna dimaag apne zamane ke hai payro. Those people who could have been the leaders of their time, these people with their old mentality have become followers of their time. No leadership. You know, Mustafa Adami raised in a small Indian town, 
but he know he does the work which we people go grown up in the West can't do. We ne actually we never make even effort. But if you go to most uh, people in the dark rooms, have you read what Mustafa Azmi Rahmanullah has written? They don't know. Actually, even they don't know the question which were raised. So this is a you know, no doubt a really, real problem. That what I really I want to emphasize that if you want us you know, to make ourselves relevant to the time, relevant to the society, and people can benefit and Islam actually can move forward. The way to understand your time, the, you know, because people live in a time and a space, you can't separate yourself from the time and space that you live in. All the prophets and messengers, they were relevant to that time. That was Mujaddid means Islam. That when a Mujaddid comes, he understands the problem and questions the first time, and then he wants to answer, he wants to explain Islam the light of those new questions. That's what Imam Ghazali did. Imam Ghazali knew really the problem of his society is philosophy. So he, you know, he wanted to deal with that problem, and then he wrote his work as <coughs> a philosopher. You know, in the time here comes to him, he realized what are the problems of society, for, you know, from the Kalam and from this, from that, and then he wants to deal with, you know, with this, this, those questions. So in every century, the people in Islam who have been really leading Aimma, like Imam Hanifa, everybody said that you are a Hanafi. But see what he has done. Imam Hanifa realized that the Abbasid Empire is newly established. Great empire. If I don't help them, what will happen? They will borrow laws from Roman Empire, Roman tradition. He provided, he gave them, you know, uh, laws, and then he gave them students, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad, who can help Abbas Empire. So then Abbas Empire does not need to borrow any law from, from Romans. In our time, what happening actually is that we don't have this mentality. We say we are Hanafi, but we don't feel like Abu Hanifa, Allah Ta'ala. Look really whatever we have done in Islamic finance, all borrowed. Ideas are borrowed, you know, our solutions are borrowed, nothing new. Nothing from our thinking. Imam Hanifa was not the original thinker. He did not borrow anything from Roman laws. He, 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 he spent time to understand the problems. He, understand, he understood the problems of society. He knew really how to organize the laws which can be more relevant to his time. But we actually are his, his followers and, and our names ourselves Hanifi. But we don't, we actually we don't even don't understand the problems of our, 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 our time. So, you know, whatever we do really, it always borrowed. Ideas are borrowed, solutions are borrowed, questions are borrowed. You know, even actually when we write books on Islamic economics and finance, if you read the definition of, you know, Islamic economics and finance, it all, even definitions are borrowed. And some of them have got the words which are kufr, which are not Islamic, because we just copy them blindly. So, this really, because you have, you know, heard, uh, you know, Sheikh Imtiyad, mashallah, in such a detail, that, you know, one person, how much work he did, Though that person was born and raised in India, now we are in this country. Think really that what we need to do, you know, learn from him, uh, you know, and, and move forward. Mustafa Azmi's work, no doubt, has been ignored by Orientalists, by Western people, by even many, many Muslims. And the reason for that, because, you know, this, this kind of the work, they, you know, they are helpful, but they are, you know, for, for a limited use. Real thing really after to move forward, meaning it to understand really the problems of the West and to produce a work which are not like answering or refuting or debating. It should be original plan. Meaning is we need to produce those works which make very clear from the details really how hadith was in the time of the companions. When the companions received the hadith from the Prophet and when they gathered it and when they used it, what was the methodology? Then somebody should work really on the time time what Tawin have been doing, how they received the knowledge of the Hadith from the Sahaba and how they preserved it and how they moved it forward and what actually the procedure they have done really to authenticate the Hadith. If you do these basic works, then we don't need to refute anybody. People can see oh, very clearly, really, it will demonstrate properly that how authentic this has been from the very beginning. So these are, there are a lot of gaps really in our study and our research. And that actually I, I would emphasize in many of your ulama, if you can start something like that. What Mustafa Azmi has done, you know, he laid down the real foundation. But that's not enough. We need to move forward. And that really to start the works originally from the, from, the, from, the, from the basic, not keeping any question in the mind. Rather than really explain to people, just imagine really, people are ignored. They don't know things. You want to explain to them what exactly Hadith was in the time, during the time of the companions. What did they understood? What happened? Did there really have this actually is just a you know, recording of a uh, Jahiri Sunnah? As Shaft makes Shaft and his followers make really that you know, Sunnah. When you say Sunnah, it means uh, in local cultures, basically Jahiri culture. It was not in uh, culture of the, of the Prophet. 
and, and that of Allah and the scripture by Abu Hanifa and Malik and people of Fuqaf, Kufa and Medina and Sham, they used to, to them, fake meant the local culture. Fake meant the culture of the people of that time. Then the reaction happened to that. A new generation came, they wanted to make everything Islamic, so they produced, you know, they, they invented many, many hadith for a rival, you know, fiqh. So that becomes the fiqh of the period of the hadith. Then the fiqh are here really. Now their work is in, in, in fact. So what they did, they invented hadith to support them. So basically both are lies. The school of Ahlul Hadith is a lie, and the school of the fiqh is all lies. That what, you know, their thinking is, that what Mustafa Adnir Rahmanullah Taqli no doubt refuted and properly, nicely. But we need to do from the beginning, produce those books which can demonstrate properly during the time of the companions, how, what, what was the Sunnah, what they, when there's a Sunnah, what means it? Does Sunnah of the Prophet have any similarity with the Jahili Sunnah? There could be something, but vast, you know, part of their Sunnah has nothing to be Jahili. That we need to make very clear, that, you know, Find out every single thing when they use the word sunnah, in what they say and what was the local culture, what was the custom of the people in Yemen, in, in, in Najd, in Hejaz, in Iraq, or anywhere in the world. How the sunnah of the Prophet has been different from this culture. So once we do this thing, it's such a way to move forward. Then, you know, then we can't complain that people don't ignore us. They will not ignore you. They have to study these things. The reason they ignore it, because it is more polemic and more, you know, more debating thing, more refuting thing. This thing easily people can ignore. But if you produce original words on those grounds, certainly people want to know. And most people actually in the West, they are fair-minded. They want to understand, you know, and, you know, when they, when they study Islam, they want to know it more. Same about the Quran, same about, about the film. So there are really so much words need to, to be done. But the way is that we come out from our own mentality, as Iqbal has said, that don't become followers. Be ahead of your time. Think really that what your time requires, what are the you know, issues of your time. Once we do, inshallah, uh, you know, it will be helpful for us and for, uh, you know, for, for, for the uh, population here. Should we stop here? Two minutes left. Two minutes left. Uh, Jazakumullah khairan to all of you uh, for attending. Jazakumullah khairan to Sheikh Akram um, and for all the speakers for attending. And um, I hope that this conference has, hasn't just been a, a, an act of hagiography or relating the virtues of uh, Sheikh uh, Azmi, but it's hopefully just laying out his inspirational work so that we can be inspired. And so as many of you are, are learned people, uh, people of scholarship, to hope that you can take up his lead and to follow his example and to um, produce original scholarly works that make a contribution. And I think that, that all the speakers here have given guidelines on how Sheikh Azami's work can be something of an inspiration, but not maybe necessarily the blueprint in every single detail. That he had his time and he, and he had an original way of thinking for his time. But maybe there will be challenges in your, own, in your own time where you have to take a different route, but to still contribute, to still have um, a seriousness with regards to studying and to know that studying doesn't just finish now. And I think with that, inshallah, we'll conclude with a, a dua from Sheikh Akram for all of us and, um, and then the Adana Maghrib soon. Um, the Asa, there, there are some books being sold at the back from Sheikh Akram um, on that table that's in the middle as well as some leaflets as well that you can take from the Asalam Institute. Um, and so again, thank you all for coming, and um, we'll leave it with Sheikh. So, do you have any more announcements? No?